Thursday morning at 6 p.m. on March the 6th, and the Bel Air Beach City Council meeting will now come to order. Uh, we're going to begin this meeting with an invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, this month, I will be doing the invocation. Uh, please join me in prayer. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you for blessing us with this beautiful city that we are able to call our home. We also thank you. We also thank you for blessing our city with the wonderful residents that live within, talented leaders who selflessly give their time and energy to the city of Bel Air Beach. This evening, Lord, we pray for a productive council meeting that will lead to positive outcomes, not only for our community, but also for those who serve within. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the question. Council Member Frank Banker. Present. Council Member Belinda Livingstone. Present. Council Member Lloyd Roberts. Here. Council Member Mike Zabel. Here. Vice Mayor Jody Shirley. Here. Mayor Dave Gaddis. Here. City Manager Kyle Riefler. Present. City Attorney Randy Mora. Present. And Council Member Leslie Notero was unable to attend. Thank you, Peg. Uh, our first order of business is approval of the agenda. Motion. Do I have a motion? motion made by Frank Banker? Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mike Sable. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The agenda is approved. Now we move to citizens' comments. If any citizen would like to address the council about a topic not already on the agenda, please raise your hand and wait to be called on. We ask that you limit your comments to no more than three minutes. If any council members would like to respond to the citizens' comments, please hold your responses until we reach council comments at the end of the meeting. Um, before I call on uh, anyone in the audience, I already have one card uh, from Ms. Vicki Dwyer from uh, 111 14th Street. Uh, please step up to the podium. And uh, it's my understanding that uh, uh, Debbie Mall has yielded her three minutes. Good evening, Mayor Gaddis, council men and women. Thank you for serving our community. My name is Vicki Dwyer, and my husband, Russ, our Marine son, Peter, and I live on 14th Street. We moved here just one year ago and mostly love our community. I'm here today to address a topic from the February 25th email where Councilman Lloyd Roberts is looking for solutions to traffic on the Gulf and Causeway two-way turn. His proposed idea is to remove the two lanes turning left onto the causeway, restore the blinking yellow light, use the two right lanes to proceed straight, the left outer lane will be the only turn lane onto the causeway, remove the existing island and palm tree, but the crosswalk would remain. The existing center merge will feed the left-hand turn lane, supposedly ensuring that north-south traffic is not affected. With the proposed changes, 170 or more driving residents from the 85 houses on 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th streets will be affected. After living here for a year, I see these traffic patterns because I drive in and around them multiple times a day, and I use the, cro the crosswalk on a regular basis. The amount of traffic turning left to the causeway always far outweighs the traffic going straight. What would be the purpose of creating two lanes to go straight toward Indian Rocks when this is not a traffic problem and we're just quickly into one lane anyway? As I dissect this proposal, I will agree that a blinking yellow light turning left is long overdue. The rest I am completely in disagreement with. with a res as a resident of that immediate area, I can attest that there is always a backup of traffic turning left on the causeway during the heavier traffic times but cars are able to condense into the two turn lanes and then make the turn. Having a flashing yellow light will absolutely allow them to keep moving. Currently, to turn left, I have to sneak out into traffic and wait in the center lane until there is an opening or the traffic clears up, 
With the proposed changes, that center lane will not be available to any of us on those streets for this purpose, making it very difficult to turn left because of the fact that there is still constant traffic coming from the south, whether it be bridge traffic or Indian Rocks traffic, cars that are coming from either direction rarely slow down for cars pulling out. It would be much more difficult to get into that turn lane because no one is going to let us cut in. It will be even more difficult to cross through that single long lane of cars to get to the far lane to cross toward Indian Rocks. Removing the island and the beautiful palm tree would definitely take away a part of the charm of Bel Air Beach and would absolutely create a greater problem with pedestrian crossing. Currently, it is still not safe to cross toward the beach because cars in general do not pay attention and the flashing yellow lights aren't bright enough to stop the cars as evidenced by cars still running through flashing lights when we cross. By removing the island and changing two lanes to three lanes of traffic will only make uh, crossing a greater safety issue. We can all predict that the uh, natural response for drivers to speed up in order to make that light since there's only one lane and they won't be paying attention to light flashing lights for the pedestrian crossing. After talking with many neighbors within the community, no one can understand why this change would be made. Moving forward with this proposal would be a mistake and a complete disservice to the surrounding residents and will highly restrict our ability to get out of our streets. The only part I support is the left turn arrow to a flashing yellow. As I close, I would strongly encourage this council to maintain a focus on our community to make improvements that centers on the needs and the conveniences for us, the taxpaying residents of Bel Air Beach and to be careful of changing or fixing things to accommodate the traffic increases from visitors and tourists. As long as we are a thoroughfare for tourists, we will always have heavy traffic, which can never be fixed with these proposed changes. It will only cripple a portion of our own community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Dwyer. Uh, yes, please come up and give us your name and your address. My name is Kathleen Plazer and I live on 21st Street, 106. Tonight I wish to engage the City Council on two items of concern to me. Both deal with disability accommodation. I would like the City to relook the bridge connection from Gulf Boulevard and the beach just north of the Beller Beach Motel. I brought this up to a council member last year and heard nothing. Perhaps together you can come up with a plan that doesn't exclude the handicap living close by and using this path to the beach. This relatively new bridge structure does not meet the requirements of the disabled residents near its location. Last year, at the end of the summer, my son and my handicapped grandson took the bridge to the beach. My grandson rides in a canvas wagon as he is unable to walk and his motor skills on his right side are poor. My son and grandson reached the edge of the bridge where it meets the beach and because of the poor design of the bridge, the wagon tipped over my grandson and son were tossed to the ground. My son fell trying to stop the wagon from overturning. Soon after, my son tried it again, approaching the beach at a different angle and then once again, the wagon was tossed and my handicapped grandson was tossed with his dad onto the beach. My grandson is now afraid to get to the beach using this path. I walked the bridge to see what the problem was, and as a disabled veteran, I found it challenging to walk up the bridge and in, especially when it's sandy. The handrail was too wide to get a grip, and I was afraid I was going to slip and fall. The second disability accommodation I would like to bring to your attention is that my grandson is learning to walk with a small walker, and since we have no sidewalks, he walks in the street. I would like to see if the city can put up traffic signs for warning drivers to be aware there's a small disabled child on the 21st Street. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Glazer. Yes, John Hensick. John Hensick, 22nd Street. I'd like to speak to uh, Councilman Zabel's suggestion or thoughts on this uh, traffic issue. For historical purposes, when we moved here in 2015, there was only one single left turn lane with a flashing yellow light. Um, being as how I've been involved in safety 
in my military career, and I look at what we have there, proximity of that crosswalk to this traffic light did not make sense only because there's a parking lot over there. Um, the councilman suggested that the island go away and leave the crosswalk. You're still, irregardless, going to have traffic jammed up no matter how many left turn lanes you have. And again, previous administrations for historical purposes have attempted to work with the city of Clearwater Beach to no avail. We are, because of their problem and that rotary, we're the um, default to get to the beaches. I don't know what the solution is, but if I were in a position to help make decisions, I take the crosswalk and the median out all together. Traffic being what it is, I understand. It can be backed up all the way to 22nd Street. Unfortunately, we've learned in the time we've been here, we get our stuff done Monday through Friday and limit any vehicular movement on the weekends only because you can't get in or get up like on the Gulf Boulevard. And even when my wife and I will walk to the, uh, to the beach, over there by the motel, it's next to impossible for traffic to yield three lanes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hansen. Yes, sir, Mr. Mall. Hi, everybody. Uh, Roger Mall, 115 Causeway Boulevard, uh, across the street. Um, I just learned about this uh, island proposal to uh, banish it, so I thought, uh, like uh, the previous gentleman, to give a little historic uh, perspective. Uh, originally, when I came, it was over 20 years ago that we moved into the community, and at that time, uh, basically, anybody who tried to cross Go Boulevard was a target because the same traffic that you see now was there without any kind of controls. And uh, especially since uh, this first uh, beach access um, and so close to the turn, uh, people take that turn and then just fire up. And so when they put in the two islands, that basically helps solve that problem because of the flashing lights. Now with the flashing lights, I think they'd be more effective if we change the, the color just because every construction truck in the area has uh, amber lights. But uh, you know, for you guys, I can see where it's frustrating for the people who live farther uh, north uh, trying to get that light, whoever it was when they made the double turn lanes that came up with the idea that it would be a left turn only, that was, I think, a, a poor decision because the poor people that are north of, uh, of uh, Causeway, you have to wait forever because you can't turn when there's no traffic coming the other way. So doing the fa flashing light would make a huge difference, and I see that as really being the only remedy for the people turning left, because if you take out those islands, what had happened before they had the islands in is not only were they rushing and not paying attention to our citizens, but it backed all the way up. It, it, even during spring break weekends, it almost went all the way to Clearwater. So that would affect everybody getting out on the Gulf Boulevard, and we're basically trapped inside our community because people won't let us in in order to get out to, to Gulf Boulevard. So I would suggest that you rethink taking out those islands just because I remember the headaches that we had before we put them in and, and the, uh, this, the downgrading of safety that was there by not having uh, those islands. So so I would suggest that we keep the islands and maybe even put one farther down so that the people that are at the north side of the city can get out and the people trying to get to Clearwater Beach uh, make it so that you can't get by. Uh, thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mall. Anyone else? Yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tammy Lavenda, 97 Harbor Drive. Um, I'm here tonight just to give a couple of save the dates for um, the new Beller Beach Community Foundation, our new nonprofit that we started in November. Um, a quick save the date for our spring fundraiser, the Earth Day Sunset Social, on April 22nd from 6 to 9 p.m. You can see our website for more details, bellairbeachcommunityfoundation.org. And we just like to thank in advance our sponsors. We now have Duke Energy, Waste Management, and Rita Swope from Century 21 as our sponsors. 
We have many in-kind um, sponsors that have donated great gifts for our raffle. And I'd like to thank um, in advance the volunteers that we have. We do need a couple of more. So if you're interested in volunteering for just maybe an hour at the event, um, please reach out to one of us, either um, Wendy Gaddis, Nicole, or myself. Um, the next save the date is April 15th, which is our next um, bridge cleanup. We adopted the bridge through Keep Pinellas Beautiful, so if you're interested in that, it's from 9 till 11. I'd like to say a quick thank you to everyone who donated to our local animals in need in the month of February. Um, they greatly appreciated it, and so did we. And then I'm going to switch gears real quick um, and put my park and rec board hat on and say, um, if you like the yoga classes that we're currently doing on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, a Tuesday class was just added in the building. And then, <clears throat> if you've seen them, we have the embroidered Beller Beach um, fanny packs. We only have three left, and we're probably like, not getting any more. So if you're interested in one of those, please make sure that you stop by City Hall. And we did get new um, embroidered hand towels in. They were out of stock. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Linda. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Randy Lovis, 13th Street. I think the uh, idea about moving, removing the palm trees in the island between 12th and 13th is really a terrible idea. There's nonstop traffic going northbound to Clearwater. I live on 13th and we can't get out. Uh, it's so bad for the people on 12th that they loop around and come out on 13th just to give them a little bit better of a shot. Okay. Um, I sent an email last week extensively detailing a lot of issues with this plan. I don't know who saw the email or the video. I, I took a video out on the street of all the traffic. I don't know if anybody saw that. I, I saw the video either. I can't ask here because you don't allow questions. A number of months ago, I came here asking about three more benches at the 12th Street access. Like, we used to have six. Now they're down to three. They're nicer now, but they're, they're down to three. And cleaning up the, the real high weeds that were blocking one of the southmost bench and getting a bike rack so the bikers don't chain their bikes to the benches that we have so at least we could sit there. Uh, Kyle you did a great job trimming those weeds, getting those weeds stripped up. So I, I thank you. I appreciate that. I have no idea on status of getting more benches or a bike rack, and I can't ask now. Uh, I'll reiterate again that this policy of not taking any questions from the public is, I think, is really messed up. You can say, why don't you email your questions in? I did last week regarding my issues, my concerns about this uh, uh, crossway and taking that island down. No one responded, so I have no idea where your, your head is with that, if anybody even saw it or they care. Okay. I can't always make it here during the day to meet with Mike Zabel during his open office hours, so I get no answers. I, under, I understand your concerns about things getting out of hand like they did maybe in the past, but there's better ways to deal with things than refusing to answer questions from the constituents or the public that you're, you're here to serve. Uh, I, I like to say Bel Air Beach has implemented the Walla Walla management technique. Okay, I go to Walla Walla all the time. I used to go with my wife for breakfast and lunch and we they have tables we could sit out there and enjoy our lunch and breakfast and whatever. Uh, Wawa had a real big issue on Missouri Avenue with all the homeless, homeless coming from all over the place, taking up those tables. So the uh, Wawa management decided they get rid of two thirds of the tables. So that way the homeless won't have anywhere to sit. Okay, so I think there's other ways to deal with unruly people or people that are you know, out of line or asking crazy questions or doing something, but just to say that you're not taking any questions, where's the public to go to get answers to these questions, other than trying to squeeze in a date with Mike, the thing or sending in an email that you don't know you're going to get answered. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, Mr. Lovett. Would anyone else like to speak? Yes. Good evening, Jennifer Pope, 523 Bell Pile. Um, I actually, for the first time, just learned I can't ask questions, so I do not have anything prepared. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is the ordinance that you are um, reading for the second time today around setbacks. 
I wanted to uh, get a better understanding of why we have arbitrarily chosen plots and land. I'm sorry. Uh, that is one of our agenda items, and uh, I'm going to let you continue, but normally if there's an agenda item, we give you the opportunity to speak while we're discussing it. Okay. Uh, we so can. you can continue now, or you can continue during that agenda item. It may, may serve you better if you uh, wait until then. Absolutely. I definitely will wait. And my understanding is that we were just going to read the uh, title of it and vote. So if we're going to actually have discussion on it, I'd be happy to wait. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I'm Ken Williams, uh, 1021 Palm Drive, right over here on the causeway. <coughs> as far as uh, removing the island, I just wanted to bring up some more of the safety issues with that. Um, that is my way of getting over to the beach. Um, because I live right here on the causeway. So um, what I have found, if that walk is taken away, is that when I go across the street and I'm at the light and I go to walk across the street there, all the people that are turning right there that have a right turn on red, they're not paying any attention to the crosswalk. They're not paying any attention to that little light that says, I'm able to walk. They're looking to the left to see if there's any cars coming. I almost got hit probably two, three times after the light had changed, walking out to cross the street at that light. I'm talking the traffic light. So if we remove the crosswalk, it, it's, you know, that's crazy. So removing the crosswalk, I think, should not even be on the agenda. Um, removing the island also, I believe, is a bad idea because the island actually triggers people to see that there is a crosswalk. Um, and I almost got hit a few times even walking across the island with the lights flashing. Um, you know, I, I totally will sit and wait and make sure that the car is slowing down because the car is, you know, they, they tend to not even slow down unless somebody's standing in the middle of the road. So um, just wanted to make that safety issue brought up. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any other comments? All right, citizen comments are closed. All right, now we are on to item number three. Uh, this is a presentation uh, the Pinellas County Sewer Rehabilitation Project. Um, yes, sir, uh, please come on up and uh, introduce yourself. Mayor and council member, my name is Dennis Simpson. I'm with Pinellas County Utilities um, Engineering Division, and I'm in charge of the horizontal assets. And uh, the lining projects are under my jurisdiction. Um, I have here um, Joe Boggs, he's with Public Works Inspection, and he's in charge of inspection, and also have uh, uh, inliner contractor, and his name is John Sutherland. Um, cured in place um, lining contract, uh, gravity sewer is a trenchless technology, and um, it's basically for rehabilitating um, deteriorating gravity sewers, and that is done by lining. And what is, they do is basically they take a lining um, thing and put into the pipe and by um, um, ear, steam, and ultraviolet light they expand the uh, lining and therefore stop the, uh, the filter, um, infiltration of water into the sewer. Um, presently we have a contract which is on uh, construction here in Pelican Delaware Beach and um, from what I understand, there were some issues, and I'm here to basically uh, respond to those issues. Sure. Uh, what, what would you like to review the issues, the, the complaints that, uh, or, or uh, city manager uh, Reefer, uh, would you like to uh, explain what the issues are? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, I welcome the Pinellas County Utilities on because. Uh, they got underway with the, the project he's referring to, which is the Sanitary Sewer Rehabilitation Project, um, who's the contractors at Liner Solutions. 
and uh, we did not have any knowledge of uh, this project, which is you know going to be a couple months long, spanning the city. Uh, when I first found out about it, I didn't know. Uh, I heard about it happening on Fifth Street, and I started trying to contact the county to find out the extent of the project. Turns out it was it was pretty much the whole city. So um, since then, I've been in contact with the county, and uh, they provided uh, continuing information to me, which has been helpful. I guess at some point, um, we just kind of dropped the ball on notifying the city that this was coming up. Um, and I just got, I covered with the county how, you know, how important it is for us to know um, because the citizens will call us first to find out what's going on. So um, I, I then, since being in contact with the county, asked that they could come out to this meeting and, and um, just kind of go over the project and uh, address any concerns that um, the citizens might have um, due to the scope of the project. And I, I guess the biggest concern was why weren't we notified? And, and I, I understand that uh, door tags went out, but it was the day before the project. And uh, I think many people were caught off guard. Uh, and there were also some overflows where they they just were unaware of the project completely, weren't at home, and came home to a big mess. Yes. Yes. Um, we normally um, would notify, but we have decided that on large projects like this because I think we're doing about 60 to 70 percent of the gravity sewers in Bel Air Beach. So for a project this size, I think we're going to, from here on, notify the city to let them know that we're coming. Uh, normally, what happens is that the project gets bid, it gets awarded, and then when the construction start, they would do cleaning. At that time, we would not notify the residents, but before they do the lining, because with the lining, they're basically going to be blocking this, this lateral flows into the line. And that's usually for a segment, say 400 feet, it only takes about a day of work. So they notify 24 hours before by putting door hangers on the, on the um, residents to let them know that they're going to be doing the lining in that segment. And as they progress, they will do more um, door hangers. Have you uh, uh, installed any linings yet in Miller Beach, or, or are you only doing testing and, uh, and well, Yes, sir. As of right now, we're I'm about, sorry, sir, for the record, could you please state your name? Joe Box with the Pinellas County Construction Administration. So at this point so far, we have roughly about 80 lines left to line. We we started out with 132, I believe. So we still have 80 more to go. We're trying. Um, I, I understand that um, Councilwoman Coleman, uh, she was affected by it. I apologize about that. Um, that is from cleaning the line. Um, and like Dennis was saying, when we line, that's when the notices go out because your sewage is actually being backed up. So the more water you use, the more chance this going to flow back into your house. And we've also learned that if you give out a notice a week ahead of time, people forget about it. 72 hours, people forget about it. So normally what they do is on Friday, they put out Monday's notices. Monday they'll do Tuesday, Wednesday notices. About 48 hours is what they've been doing. And then, you know, so Wednesday, so Tuesday they'll do Thursday, Friday notices. And then again, like on Thursday, they'll go back and do Friday's notices again because it was more than 48 hours. We try to try to keep it around 48 hours. I don't like 24, because that is a short notice. You know, some people, they're like, oh, I had big plans for tomorrow, my son's birthday party. They don't work on, on the weekend, but you never know who's doing what during the week, especially if something goes wrong. It could be a very late night. Thank you. Um, just curious, what's the maximum calls that are that you've encountered that would be impacted uh, during one of these cleanings or linings? It's, it's really hard to say because some of your runs might be a 200-foot line segment. Some of them might be a 400-foot. 
um, depending on how many homes, you know, how big your lots are. You know, you might only have, well, some of the, some of the runs here that we, we've done, uh, the side street right over here, there's five laterals on it. Um, so, you know, that's a 400 foot shot. Um, and I'm uh, just curious uh, about what's the uh, time span for that one, that one line that you did? This, the one right next door right here, um, what, what is the name of the street here? Right, right on the other side of the parking lot. Cedar. Cedar. Um, that day there, they was done by three o'clock. They started they they started televising at seven a.m. and they were completely done and gone by three o'clock. Okay, so you came to my street, Twenty Second Street, and we didn't know if you were complete. It, it, it looked like you were in one hole over here for a while. That was probably the cleaning crew. Okay, and then uh, we, we really just didn't know. We had no clue as to what was going on other than, hey, uh, don't run your water uh, after 7 a.m., something like that. I think that's what the note said. But we really just had no information, and we were uh, a little afraid that we would come home uh, to what um, Vice Mayor Shirley came home to. So I think, yes, uh, especially if it's a, if it's if it's possible, it might not be a bad idea just to bang on the door and just say, hey, we're starting or something like that, because I'm sure there's some people that won't even know that tag's on their door. And that's one thing that we run across, too. Um, the, the gentleman that's here now, um, his name is Johnny. If anybody, if you see him out, he's, he's the foreman of the liner. He's great. When, when that, normally when the liner goes in, he will go to each house and say, can I get your phone number so I can put you on a group text and let you know, hey, okay, you, you're free to use yours, you're free to use yours, you're free to use yours. You know, he does, he does do that. Um, if we're only on a street that's, you know, like over here, the Cedar's only got five, he'll just come knock on the door and say, you're free. Um, he, you know, but when you got, a lot of times we, they try to do double shots, meaning 800 feet. So you might have 10, 15 services all together. Um, that's when he'll do a group chat with the neighborhood. And then, you know, he's on site walking back and forth. The guys are on site. My inspector's on site. If, if you guys ever see, you know, somebody on the street, look for Pinellas County truck. You know, his name is Trevor Logan. He, he'll be more than happy to answer anything. Get with Kyle. Kyle has my contact information. My phone's always on. I always answer emails, so if anybody's got any questions, just reach out to me. I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer anything you've got. Great. Thank you very much. Do I have a question? I just want to add a couple of things, and that is, I mean, I think I voiced my concerns with you over the phone, but we, you know, the, the day I came home, you were just cleaning pipes on, on my street. Had no idea this was happening. There was no notices, no, no information provided. Um, came home to an absolute mess because the cleaning just blew through my toilets. Um, I'm sure, and I was not the only person on the street, I'm sure probably several other residents have dealt with the same issue. I called Pinellas County Utilities. It was told that you guys were not providing any service out there. There was no construction going on. There was nothing being done. That caused, and what they told me to do was talk to risk management. That was their only answer. They would not even research. They talk, they, I made them check twice with your service technicians to see if they were doing anything out there. Insisted nothing was being done. That concerned me. I called Kyle, because at this point now it's after five, on his cell phone, I'm sure he's probably home. He had no idea what was going on. I know you own those utility lines, but they run through our city. Any work being done in our city needs to go through our city manager, because he's going to get the first phone. And, no, and then no all of us will get the call too. And there, there was no communication with anyone. That, so that's got to be addressed moving forward. Then as we move forward in this project, you must know today where you're going to be tomorrow. It would be nice to be able to, for Patty to send an email at least to our residents to know, hey, we're working on, you know, whatever streets, these three streets over the next three days, expect to see a door hang or something so that we're aware of what's happening because that on my street i guess we've only been our lines been clean there's
there's not, it has not been Lyme. So I don't know what kind of havoc that's going to cause in my house, but I'm really not happy with the outcome of what happened at my house today. No, and like I said, I apologize about that. I was not aware of that day that the cleaning crew was even in the city. I was not informed of that. Which I, then creates the other question is, how safe are our utilities? If anyone can come into our city and tap into our lines, how safe is that as a resident? It's not very safe. It causes concern to me. Well, yes, it, it, it does. But like I said, I, I was not aware of the cleaning crew even being in Bellwear Bluffs. My understanding, they was in Largo. You know, so I, that's not my jurisdiction. I, nothing else I can do. Um, as far as getting the problem with giving you guys the schedule, it's a schedule. It's, it says, okay, we might be here. Um, for instance, today, I can't remember what street the guys was on today because we had two line increases here today. One of them has an offset joint in the pipe. They wasn't able to work. So I, so I don't know when, you know, if I tell you that it was your street today and all of a sudden you come home thinking, oh gosh, it's over with, I don't have water in my bathroom, done well nothing happened so we're going to come back but your the point was i said maybe you hadn't sent an email we project to do these streets watch for a door hanger I, you're not going to hang a door hanger unless you're doing the work right or no the door hanger was up was there. When, when they went and pre-videoed this morning they found that the pipe was busted so we could not put a liner in today so you know and, and that's and sometimes you know when when the truck comes the liner that you were supposed to do today might be on the very bottom. And those guys aren't going to dig through 2,000 feet of liner to get that one off. I just, I'm, in the, I'm a contractor. I find it incredible that your subcontractor can't do a better job communicating with the residents. And I'll just say, you need to get them in line and communicate better. No problem. Any other comments or questions from the council? You're just, like, understand correctly you're just doing this main sewer line you're not doing the branches from the houses right no. so how would that back up i mean of course it where could back up but when you're cleaning them you're using like a, a sandblasting tool it's on it's, it's a jet nozzle on the yeah. end of a hose yes and but, if the if your y is on backwards when they when they pull back it will push water up you know it, it will um, if the pressure is too high, it'll, it'll do the same thing. If you're descaling, which some of these older pipes, you know, they do have buildup on them. They do, do need to be descaled before we put a liner in. Because if not, you're just you're, you're shrinking the pipe down even smaller. Um, so sometimes you do have to use high pressure, and, you know, and, and it does. It, it happens. You know, it's, you know, I don't like when it happens, but. It, Flat tire, you're gonna say a flat tire. Yeah, I'm you're just saying get, the pressure you're using is probably under 160 psi, and your branch tailpipe coming off the house has got to be at least 15 to 25 feet. So that extent, I can't see how much you would going back in the house. John, what are they normally running? Pressure? Uh, 600 psi. 600? Yeah. And if it's a straight, you know, a pretty flat lateral, it's, it's going to blow it up there. Council Member Baker, uh, I was home whenever they, they whatever, whatever it was that they did on our line, and it made, it made the toilets bubble, and we heard things in the sink, it, it very disturbing. I believe, I believe they did our street already, 8th Street, did you complete 8th Street yet? Yes, I, I believe 8th Street has been line. Yeah, I don't believe it. I think he did a marvelous job. Uh, the crew was very professional um, out there. Uh, they started three minutes before seven, which isn't allowed. That's, that's I'll make sure I tell them that. that. But no, I'm just saying, I, I, he was very professional. He, he, he tied up our street. He didn't even tie up our street. He, he blocked half the street. And we can always go down South Street. But he does it very professionally. He had the cones out and everything like that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the uh, council? Uh, I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for coming out and answering some questions and trying to clear things up. No problem. Uh, we uh, look forward to a much broader outcome going forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. <coughs> All right. Item four. We have a presentation from the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office.
office. Again, to the law enforcement monthly report. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergeant Roy Switch with the Nelson County Sheriff's Office. And tonight I'm presenting the activity for January of 2023. Under the UCR Property and Person Crimes and Habit Report, there was zero across the board. So there was no criminal activity in the city that month. However, there were five people arrested and that resulted all from traffic activity. So traffic stops, DUIs, warrant arrests, and some drug paraphernalia. Moving forward for deputy activity, there were a total of 683 events within the city. Leading that, as usual, were the direct patrols and then traffic enforcement. There were no crashes in the city, so I think that should make everybody happy hearing that. And then lastly, there were a combination of 174 citations and warnings issued for the month. And that is all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, I think that uh, is not here. Uh, Mr. Reaper, would you like to uh, give us a summary on the uh, code enforcement report? Yes, sir. Happily. Uh, so we did this is our second time going around with this new format of the uh, code enforcement report. Um, Steve's been working with the template that we uh, put together. And um, this month we had 51 uh, uh, listings in our report. Uh, some of them were closed out, some of them were still ongoing. Um, again, I did, did some pie charts just to show the categories of the, uh, the violations that are being covered. Um, we also, uh, the distribution of the city streets. Um, our outstanding code violations, um, we've had some developments. Uh, the the uh, dangerous structure, uh, we had a, a hearing for at the Board of Adjustments scheduled for March 9th um, after the city attorney's been in contact with the attorney representing uh, the resident. Uh, it was advised that we, uh, we postpone to, to attempt to make a reasonable accommodation for the structure. So um, it's our intent to, to work forward to try to come to some kind of uh, something that's acceptable to the city um, that's within, within the law and uh, we'll give you a follow-up quite like those. The, uh, we had a, a hearing since the last meeting on uh, February 23rd for the law uh, resident that had some uh, some voted hard areas, some more growth. Um, so that, that was issued an order of fine and um, some work's been done on that property. It, uh, it's not quite done yet. I'm meeting with someone tomorrow to follow up on what still needs to be done. The unpermitted remodel uh, construction nuisance, so it was a roof on the whole of RV. Um, they've actually done work on the roof uh, right now we discovered that they never pulled a permit properly, so we're continuing to follow up on that. That's not closed yet. Uh, the, uh, I did talk because that house is under, uh, it's advertised for sale. There's a title company that has inquired, and I have talked to them to give them an update on where we stand. Uh, we have a short term mental hearing that took place in early February um, that was given in. Uh, you know, a fine, like we typically do with the short-term rentals. And um, the, uh, another hearing, which was uh, just recently on uh, March 2nd, uh, for another overgrowth and uh, invasive species. Um, so that was, that was issued in order. We have a fine that will be starting uh, right now. Uh, we've been told that it will be contracted and cleaned up. Council, any questions or comments? Yeah. Um, Kyle, there was a hearing back in the middle of September when a tower erected on each street. Um, that's not never been, in my view, in the code enforcement. I 
mean, there was a fine assessment of $150 a day. I believe he filed for an appeal. I don't see anything in the circuit court file. I think there was an email sent to Patty that he was filing an appeal. But why is it that when the code of force was you know? I, I, I can explain that procedurally. Procedurally, you're correct that there were code enforcement proceedings in September that a warrant was issued by the magistrate. The magistrate's decision was not directly appealed, which is why you do not see anything in the circuit court. The, the decision of the magistrate at the time was that the um, <clears throat> responding party had to submit a, a um, permit application. Uh, the, a, a, I believe a preliminary permit application was received and rejected. A second attempt was made, and in, that, in response to that second attempt, uh, your city manager found that it was insufficient and not, did not form a sufficient basis for the relief, if you will, requested in the form of a permit. That is the decision that was appealed, not the magistrate's decision. In the course of, uh, after uh, informally declaring a desire to appeal that decision, the party retained legal representation, um, who is certainly well versed in the matter. Uh, I've had a few conversations with their counsel, and, we're, and we are navigating the legal boundaries around that process and whether or not uh, a permit is a possibility in that context, understanding the limited preemptions provided by federal law and otherwise. So that process is being navigated to put the city on the best footing were there to be a legal challenge and to ensure that uh, all administrative avenues have been addressed sufficiently and that's where the process stands at this moment. But to your narrower question as to why there's nothing within the circuit court, they did not, the, the, the responding party did not appeal the magistrate's decision. So the magistrate's decision is in effect the magistrate's decision was that a permit application needed to be submitted and the parties are working to resolve the, that submission. Yes, sir. Okay, but there was a $150 fine in each day. And, and the, the magistrate found that the party had complied by making a submission uh, later in the fall. But I was told that the permit he submitted was de deficient. Which was an administrative decision, but whether or not the magistrate found it sufficient for the purposes of Fulfilling the magistrate's requirement is a sort of a separate and distinct analysis. All right, because let's start from the ground up. Uh, before he put the tower up, he had a poor pack, which violated our setback rules. So why are we not, why are we catering to a hazardous condition here for now? I guess this tower's been up at least, at least nine months. Um, and we're approaching another hurricane season. Um, he has done nothing to remove that tower. I get emails, phone calls, addresses every day. I walk down that street from the neighbors surrounding that house. How much longer are we going to give this guy another bite of the apple before we do something? Uh, thank you for your question. I would say uh, your question is phrased presumes a few things, um, but what I would say to answer your question is, as to why are we still engaging in this process, I would say because the law mandates or dictates that we should. And my job is to mitigate the city's risks in, uh, in their totality, not just from the perceived risks of the neighboring property owners, but also the, the litigation um, exposure or legal requirements as set forth by uh, PRB1 and the other applicable legal provisions. So we're navigating the process, as I, as I know you attended that code enforcement Proceeding, my my argument to the magistrate on behalf of the city was that the the property owner was suggesting that a permitting process was few was a futility and was some kind of charade, if you will, and there was no point in applying because he would be denied automatically. Right. Was, and, and my response to that point was, give us an application, give us an opportunity to, be, to evaluate it, and we will evaluate it on its own merits. And that's what the parties are going through. His own legal counsel has, has stated that the permitting process submissions can be more detailed and robust and intends to make a more robust submission for the parties, consider the parties, in this case the city's consideration. So while it may be, um, the, while the timing of it may be frustrating, I would say that we are going through the process as it, as it dictates. My, also, my, my added understanding of that is that there's been towers, um, not necessarily the precise one there, over the past few decades and in, in intervening periods. Um, so um, this is not the, the first, um, 
appearance of this structure, and we are trying to make sure that as we deal with it, we do it correctly. Well, again, um, there was no circuit court file from what I can find out what you just said. Confirmed. Okay. So the 30 days have lapsed six months ago. Um, he missed the boat to file an appeal. Of the magistrate's decision, yes, sir. Okay. So that decision didn't just say he had to refile the appeal, the refile for the permit, the way I'm reading it, uh, and then he's off the hook. Second of all, again, that tower is still there. Correct. All right? And we're not doing anything about it. Disagree. I, well, I, I detail what we're doing. It may not be a solution to your satisfaction, but as it relates to code enforcement, I work at the direction of the executive of this city, of the city manager. Uh, I advise the city manager on our legal solutions, options, and recourses. And as your city attorney, I'm taking the course of action that, um, upon advice, the manager is in agreement with. I, I don't submit that my that the current plan of action may satisfy every party, but it is in keeping with the requirements of uh, Florida statutes, federal guidance, and uh, otherwise in resolving this matter. Well, you said you cited a case, and I found this case too, this little, uh versus Marion County, and it clearly says in the affirmative, the FCC has determined that local governments do not have to make reasonable accommodations for ham radio antenna structures for the structures are prohibited by residential subdivision governance conditions and restrictions, which we restrict. Again, why aren't I we think pushing this issue? Yes, sir, I don't think that I can yeah, answer you. I don't think I can like answer you or satisfaction. Remain calm. Right. I, I can remain calm because I don't live where it's going to, well, maybe we'll fly down my street. But you have four residents that are very concerned about this. And they all supported you, Dave. All right? So why aren't we enforcing our laws? Or the order. What's the point? The point is, is that you're, now you're attacking our mayor. I'm not attacking our yes, mayor. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. I agree. Point of order, you are attacking the white man. I defer to the, to the presiding officer. I would say only uh, Member Baker. I, I, I think I've answered your questions. I understand you're not satisfied or in agreement with those answers. I think the holding of this photo goes a little further than that. And it's not specifically limited to, while that quoted language is certainly in there, it's also couched in the pro, the other case law and its progeny uh, governing this. You look to these federal guidelines, there's a limited field of case law on this. I, I've reviewed it. I'm, I'm not coming just from a place of, I don't want to get people upset. I'm looking at the case law and trying to get, I've read the Despoto opinion. The, the, the Despoto opinion. I've read, uh, there's two, two major opinions out of the 50 CA. There's an opinion, there's a few other opinions that all speak to the notion that a government need not simply yield to any request or any application. You can enforce your codes, but that must be done on an analysis of the particular antenna at issue, especially ha amateur ham radio, which you cannot prohibit full stop. You have to consider whether those things can be accommodated in keeping with the aesthetic safety and other measures. And I'm saying we hang, can't consider that until we have a proper and complete submission that allows for the parties to evaluate that. I'm trying to develop a factual record that the part that the city can stand on. Whether or not you think that's a proper course of action, I understand, but I, as it relates to code enforcement, I'm working with the official and the city responsible for this. Sir, I understand what you're saying there, that there's a proper procedure. This is erected. This is already there, okay? If he submitted a permit, and it got bounced out, and there was nothing done. I'd be 100% agreement with you. But you're telling me I can go build a house, okay, get caught building a house, and then say, well, I'll submit a permit at my will. No, sir, I would submit to you that a house is quite different from an antenna. Well, uh, it's still a violation. And I, I completely understand your position, sir, and I'm working through all. I, I can't change where we are. At the end of the day, is he going to be fined $150 for every day if he does not? There's an outstanding fine now for $150 for roughly nine days. That fine is outstanding. Whether or not that fine is resolved through the process of me working with his legal counsel to mitigate the city's risk and analyze the situation, I can't disp dispositively say that, nor do I have the authority unilaterally to either impose or, or remove that fine. I, I, there is a fine in place, period, fact, full stop. Um, how that process resolves is ongoing. I had a nearly 90 minute conversation or roughly almost 
75 minute conversation with his attorney just last week at great length where we talked about the balance of the case law, where the issues go, and generally the parties were in agreement that a permit is necessary, that the city needs to, prov to provide its request as to what data is requested. As this is not a common infrastructure, I will tell you that my firm does this, um, works for municipalities in nearly a dozen municipalities from Port Ritchie to Holmes Beach. And in speaking with all of my colleagues, ham radio antenna towers are not exactly the most common issue. Uh, and that you have community to community. We're navigating a very, very niche area of law and trying to make sure that we do so properly as good stewards of the public trust. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Dale, did you have a comment? Yeah, well, that's actually more of an amendment. Um, city manager, that's the dangerous structure, I think, number 105? Yes. Listed on the code violations. Right. Okay, so it has been listed there. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions for the council? I just want to add that I like the new format. Thank you for your work, um, Kyle, and the council members that all put this together. And it just it's so much easier to follow them. Thank you, Ms. Reed. All right, we are on to item number five, which is a presentation from the Pinellas Suncoast Fire and Rescue the Rescue District. Uh, normally it's Chief Jeff Davidson, but uh, this month we have Assistant Chief Higley. Good evening, it's uh, Assistant Chief Higley, but that's all right. Good evening, Council Members, Vice Mayor, Mayor Gaddis. Um, Chief Davidson does send his apologies that he's not uh, here this evening to present to you. However, he is at, in Tallahassee at the uh, Florida Association of Special Districts um, annual meeting where he is uh, taking some classes and learning some additional stuff about special districts so that he can provide uh, you know, the highest level of service that he can to uh, our community partners, including Beller Beach. Um, last month in Beller Beach, there were 17 calls for service. There were three fire alarms and um, 14, 13 medical calls and one other. Uh, 70% Six percent of the time, uh, we met our um, call times uh, for ALS, um, and ninety percent of the time, uh, these calls were responded to you in eight minutes or thirty-one seconds or less. Uh, with that being said, last Monday we had the pleasure on February twenty-seventh of having a presentation here at the city hall, where Chief Davidson presented a proposal that we have submitted to Pinellas County. Uh, emergency services to further improve the services that we provide to the residents of what we consider North Indian Rocks Beach, Bel Air Beach, and uh, the residents of Bel Air Shore. Uh, that proposal that we have uh, provided to them would to be apply for an additional two paramedics and a um, ALS transport capable rescue uh, that would, we still have not decided if if the engine would move closer to here, to our new plant station, or we would put the rescue up there. Uh, many of your uh, folks here uh, talk about the traffic issues, and they have not gotten any better. So when I read to you those times, that only 76% that we were um, making our, our scene times, uh, that is unacceptable to the district, and we want to make sure that um, you know, we can get those numbers up in to the 90th percentile. Um, and the plan that we have come up with and we have presented will enable us to do so. Um, if you have any questions, we did a full presentation. It is public records. And um, I'll leave some cards here. Um, and we can give you that information to the residents of your community so they can kind of be informed. We are looking for uh, community feedback and I uh, believe um, we have some avenues that we can do that, and again, we can provide you that upon request, and I'll, I'll leave those cards. Um, following that, there's a process in place. So the next step in that process is called the Data Driven Focus Group. Um, that meeting is on Friday, and I will be, again, um, presenting to the fire chiefs and some other interested parties um, on this committee about our um, request, and there's about 15 other um, requests throughout the county that have been put forth, so we all kind of present our case. So the next uh, step in that is if they approve or recommend that it goes forward, 
Uh, there will be what's called the MSAC Committee, the Emergency Medical Service Advisory Council, which consists of some local political leaders and other interested parties. Um, those requests will go to that and they will vet them and again they'll move those forward up, up the chain and um, hopefully within the next few months we'll have an idea of whether this um, idea and proposal will come to fruition and again we hope that uh, the citizens of the Bel Air Beach would, would fully support that because our number one goal is to make sure that um, we're providing you the, these uh, fire and EMS services that you pay for uh, every year for us. Um, over the last couple of weeks, uh, the men and women of our district, we were able to obtain what we call an acquired structure. So if any of you goes down to any rock Beach, uh, 404 Golf Boulevard, which is called Golf Towers, the two structures next to it are going to be, well, they are pretty much demolished and making room for some new condos. Um, however, we were uh, fortunate enough to have the uh, party representing the owners allow us to trade. So how does that benefit you? Any of these real world trainings that we have, um, you know, we, we train like we do in real life. So uh, the men and women got to uh, flow water in, these, in this mid-rise, high-rise structure. We got to do some uh, firefighter safety and survival and some rescue stuff in a building that's similar to many of that in your community. Obviously the beach side and not necessarily residential, but it's still it's great training for our folks. Um, as far as the district is concerned, we've had a couple of vacancies. We've added um, two new paramedics to the district. Uh, one is a transfer from Seminole Fire Rescue, who has approximately three years of service uh, to Pinellas County. Uh, he will be put on the truck right away be able to um, treat folks. The other one is a transfer from Hillsborough County. There's a several month process depending on when the classes can get in that will, he will be a fully county clear paramedic. So those folks will be starting uh, by the end of this month and will be providing um, services to again all of the residents in our fire district. So we're welcome to have uh, two paramedics and um, it's a very difficult thing right now hiring in uh, fire and EMS is a hot topic right now. There's a, not, there's a lack of qualified candidates and we got, over the last few hirings, we've obtained some stellar um, men in this case. We had a woman in the last one, but that will be providing the top level of care that you folks have come to expect. Um, lastly, uh, Kyle and I uh, had a small hurricane expo uh, here in this room and we have gotten back together um, this year and started planning for what we hope to be a bigger and better and annual event within um, Bel Air Beach and I had suggested that actually since we have other community partners with the town of Indian Shores and the city of Indian Rocks Beach that maybe we would make it a district-wide event in that every year we can rotate it. Uh, you folks have been gracious enough to offer up um, for maybe our next first annual um, event. So him and I will be working towards uh, getting some speakers and providing a little bit more robust um, event within the community that everybody that we would like to invite, you know, whether they are in our Oak Coast area or any rocks or Indian shores. So we appreciate you folks um, allowing us to do that. And as far as the, the fire district concerns, that's all that I have for you this evening. Again, I'm going to leave some cards, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. I have one. Um, it actually, it's uh, more of a can you uh, explain what it is you're asking for for the people that did not attend the meeting, and, and if you, you can make it as brief as possible if, if you uh, if you don't mind. Okay, so briefly for the folks here in the community, um, when I started uh, for Pinellas Sun Coast 17 plus years ago, we always used to respond to our fire engine and our well, that's where we are. We don't have a rescue, but our engine down to the northernmost end of our district. However, um, that was a disservice to you folks because of the amount of time that it takes for us to get from Indian Rocks Beach to the north end of, in, uh, excuse me, Bel Air Beach. Um, and finally, we went to the closest unit dispatch. So unfortunately, uh, for you folks, I would say the majority of the time, you're getting a unit from Clearwater Beach right at Sand Key or Station 43. 
Um, yeah, you'll get a Largo or a clear, clear water in because we do want to provide the highest level of care. And the majority of the time in an EMS call, um, you're going to want closer is better. So what we're planning on doing is, regardless of what happens, we're, we're constructing a new fire station um, in hopes in northern Indian Rocks Beach. Um, with our projected data, we'll be able to hit the benchmark set by the county, and we will once again be able to service the residents of Blair Beach that pay, our, pay your tax money to us. So your EMS, as far as EMS goes, um, you only pay our fire tax, and we do, as long as we're available, we do come to those, I just want to let you guys know that, but EMS is paid to the county. But we feel as if, since you are our residents, you do support us, you do pay our taxes. We want to make sure that our men and women are responding down here to you folks. So what we've done is, again, every year they open up what's called an enhancement. You can put in for an enhancement. And Chief Davidson has been, what I feel, a godsend to our uh, fire district, and he's been working hard to provide the, you know, a higher level of service than we have in the past. Um, so we put in for that enhancement again. Basically, it's two paramedics, but it actually turns into about seven folks because you have to have two every day, and we have three shifts, and the rescue. So speaking of that, the county is getting busier, the traffic, all that stuff. So uh, we just went on it the other day. It's called 3M. Basically, it's like the world is falling apart. All of the fire department units that have transport capable units are transporting their own patients to the county. This was not like that when I started. It's so busy that the fire department has to take up the slack from the Sunstar units that we have going around the county. And I can tell you the closest unit of transport rescue is in Clearwater Beach, Rescue 41, which is downtown Largo, and then the other one, the only other one on the beach is in Treasure Island. So adding a transport rescue to our fire district we believe will benefit not only the folks here, but our other partners in Largo and you know down south where we need it to be. And again, it all comes back to being able to be um, you know as helpful as we can to everyone in the community. We're all neighbors, regardless of whether you live in this town or, or up in Clearwater or over in Largo. We want to make sure that we take care of everybody. So again, we have a lot of more information that I can provide you. We have lots of data and facts and figures and stuff and we'll be happy to email you that stuff out uh, but we would ask that you email one of us and uh, the only other comment that i have which really i'm looking for a confirmation is that this plan uh, that uh, that you have uh, does not include asking for any more money okay so no this is a uh, this would be a completely county funded uh, unit that we are asking for. So again, this is an EMS unit we're asking for. It's two paramedics and a transport capable rescue all out of the existing fund that you folks already pay into. So without getting into some uh, additional specifics, you folks pay in a lot of money and you don't necessarily receive all that back. And we just want a little bit of that back to make sure that we can provide not only you folks, but the rest of the county an elevated level of service. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just have some questions. Are you asking our residents to request this from the county? Are you asking our residents to reach out to the county to request? So I, I'm kind of confused. What you're so we have, we have submitted the request. However, just like you can email your state senators and say I support this and I support that, we do have the contact information for these um, decision makers within the county that would be happy to provide to you. Um, I have to be careful what I say at the meeting, I guess, publicly, but please, by all means, um, if you're interested, we can email you this information and give you a little bit more on that. So we would look basically just to say, hey, we really support what Chief Davidson and the Padilla Sun Coast Fire Rescue District is asking for. And we hope that you strongly consider it. I serve on that council, uh, and so I will be speaking that day. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, now we are on to item number six. Council Member Livingston, join me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
So uh, it's not uncommon for council members to, uh, to attend one of the courses offered by the Florida League of Cities. Every once in a while we get an overachiever, so I have two awards for the same person tonight. Uh, so the first one is a certificate of completion uh, for the uh, online orientation class for newly elected officials uh, awarded to the Honorable Belinda Livingstone, Council Member City of Bel Air Beach. Congratulations. second one, which is the uh, Certificate of Completion uh, for, uh, we affectionately call it EMO, but it's the Institute of Elected Municipal Officials. And uh, she completed that in St. Augustine, Florida, uh, January 20th and 21st, 2023. Presented to Belinda Livingstone, Council Member of City of Miller Beach. Right. Agenda item number seven uh, is consideration of accepting the annual comprehensive financial report uh, for the fiscal year ending September 30th, 2022, and is presented by Salt Marsh, Cleveland, and Gunn Certified Public Accounts. Sir, if you uh, would please give us your name and, uh, and let's <coughs> Good evening. My name is Chuck Landers. I'm with Salt Marsh, Cleveland, and Gunn. I uh, want to thank mayor and the council for the opportunity to once again serve as the audit firm for the city. Uh, I want to also uh, thank Kyle for his assistance through the audit process and a special thanks to Heather and Andrew as well. Uh, there's no way the audit uh, process could be completed without all the work that they do. You've been provided a draft presentation of, of the financial statements. Um, if you took the time to read through that draft, you would notice that there are some pages in there that say this information is not available. That's mainly in the statistical section, and it's also where the uh, GFOA certificate would go. Uh, the statistical section information, we have uh, the, the historical information from 2021 back to 2013, but we do not have the 2022 information yet. Heather has requested that. Uh, most of it is being held up by the county. So once that information is available, we can uh, put that in the report. I point that out because the statistical section of the financial statements isn't uh, covered by our audit opinion. So uh, our obligation is to look at that and make sure that it uh, materially agrees with the financial statements, the basic financial statements of the city. Um, and then if it doesn't agree, then we have to modify our report. I can't imagine that it's, once it's there that it's not going to agree. Um, the city is going to have to make the decision of how long they want to wait to receive that information before uh, finalizing the, the audit. Uh, there, there are a couple options that we can discuss when that time comes. Uh, the, the GFOA uh, submission is uh, the, the unextended due date is at the end of the month. Uh, you can request an application for extension, which the city did do last year uh, at our request uh, because we had set uh, issues not able to meet the debt and the timeline for that. Uh, but uh, this year it is really just in the GFOA's uh, hands, uh, waiting on them, and, and we do not have a timeline to understand when they will uh, issue that uh, certificate or uh, if it will be issued. Uh, I don't have any reason to think it wouldn't be, but again, it's, we, we don't have any timeline there. So um, we have until the end of the month to really make a decision on how the city wants to proceed with that. Um, so that it's not super urgent at the moment, but something that does need to be addressed in the next couple of weeks. So with that, uh, what I've brought to present tonight is the anticipated uh, opinion. I wouldn't expect it to change. Uh, so we have the anticipated opinion and the basic financial statements uh, here. The, uh, I'd like to take the time to just go through these in summary. Uh, it's it's you know, over 100 pages. We're not going to go through it in detail. Um, but the, the important parts, I'll point out, uh, the most important part of the financial statements that I will say is on page one, uh, this is the opinion, this is the auditor's report, so you have to go through several Roman numerals um, 
before you actually get to page one, about a sixteenth of an inch into it. So on page one, uh, the second paragraph, we do uh, cut to the chase now. There has been changes in the auditor's report uh, passed down, so we do get to the opinions here at the beginning. Instead of making the read through four pages of auditor's report, you get to the opinion. But you'll see that in the second paragraph on page one, in our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects the respective financial position of the governmental activities, the business type activities, each major fund, and the respective budgetary comparison for the general fund of the city as of and for the year ended September 30th, 2022, and the respective changes in financial position and where applicable cash flows thereof for the year then ended in accordance with the accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. So this is the first opinion that you're concerned with in your financial statements. There's going to be a few more uh, opinions as we get to uh, some more reports towards the back. But before we get there, I'll just point out a few of the financial statement highlights. On page 17, this is the statement of net position. This is what's most comparable to a balance sheet that you would see in a for-profit entity. Uh, there are uh, there is uh, technical uh, statements in here called balance sheet, but they don't necessarily represent what you would see in a for-profit business. So if you're in a for if you're uh, used to looking at for-profit entity financial statements, this is going to be the most comparable. You see that in the middle of the page, and this is as of September 30th, 2022, total assets of the city were nineteen million five hundred fifty-five thousand seven hundred ninety-five dollars. Total liabilities of the city were $2,667,000, leaving net position of $16,888,000. So of that net position, 6,450,000 of it is unrestricted, and 10,438,000 is restricted. But a healthy balance sheet. The next page would be the comparable income statement for a for-profit entity, but this is called the Statement of Activities. It starts with the expenses on the left side and then goes to the program revenues, but really I'd like to just focus on the, the bottom numbers. Let's just get to the bottom. You see that the change in net position for the city was a net increase of just under $1 million for the year, 994000 so that is the second up from the, or third up from the bottom line in the bottom right corner. Again, about a million dollar increase year over year from the year before, giving a net position at the end of the year of the $16,888,000. I did mention that uh, there are balance sheets in the statements. The very next page would be considered the balance sheet of the governmental funds. The city has two governmental funds, the general fund and the capital projects fund. I'll just point that out that you so you understand what is there. The, the uh, city has two more funds that would be considered proprietary funds or business type funds. The next page I would turn your attention to is page 23. I point this out because most people are very concerned with the budget and budget to actual, and that's what this page is: is the budget to actual for the general fund. The middle of the page is the final budget. The or the middle column on the page is the final budget. The uh, column next to the, the right is the actual, and then the far right column is the difference between the two. So you can see that total revenues were budgeted at about 2.5 million. They came in at a little over 3 million for a favorable variance of just over half a million dollars. In the middle pages or middle part of this page, you can see that total expenditures were budgeted at just over 2 million. They came in at just under 2 million for a favorable variance of $118,000, for a total favorable variance of $625,000 on the year. When you have higher revenues and lower expenses, the, uh, the favorable variance there. Um, I'll point out that uh, that line uh, where the favorable variance of 625 is shown, it currently says deficiency of revenues uh, over expense or under expenses, that needs to be changed to excess of revenues under or over excess of revenues over expenses. It was net income. So just need to revise that wording. The, I, t I mentioned this, the city has two additional funds on the next page. That uh, is the statement of net position for the proprietary funds. That's the stormwater fund and the marina fund. You can see that the assets for those two funds combined were 2.1 million 
and the total net position is also 2.1 million uh, roundings. There's very few liabilities in those two funds. And that's on page 24. The next page that I would point to is page 25. This is the statement of revenues and expenses and changes in net position for the proprietary funds. It's basically the income statement equivalent for those two funds. You see that the charges for services in the stormwater fund, 177,000. The marina fund, 82,000 for total of 260,000 between the two proprietary funds. The total operating income for those two funds netted out to 8,800, just under $9,000 uh, between the two. There were some transfers in. Uh, so the total change in net position for those funds was an increase of 33,000 after the $25,000 was transferred in from the general fund. The next several pages are the notes to the financial statements. There are a few that I would like to point out. Kyle, in your report, you were uh, referencing the hazardous structure and some uh, legal correspondence that's going on with that. I would like to uh, draw the council's attention to page 44 in the middle of the section. There is a no disclosure that currently reads, accounts receivable for the general fund includes $196,915 from a resident of the city for code violations for failure to meet construction schedule timeline ordered, to, ordered by a special magistrate on May 19th, 2021. The city has no intention to forgive these fines and believes the balance will be fully collectible. Therefore, the city has not recorded an allowance as of September 30th, 2022. That is our understanding of the city's position. If that is not the case, I would ask that you do share with us uh, to see if there should be an allowance recorded there. The reason I, and by allowance, what I mean is if that's not going to be fully collectible, and this is the number as of September 30th, it has since grown, it's on a daily basis. Um, we need to consider the, the collectability, the realizability of this asset. This uh, is a concentration, it is a material amount for the city, both uh, in every aspect of our material uh, calculations. So on a on the government-wide basis for the for the city as a whole, this is a material number. And we need Excuse to me, sure. you said that's the intent. This is not the antenna, or the not. This, this is not the uh, tall structure or the antenna. This is a construction. No, no, sir. Sort of, this it is not does not have to do with the ham radio. Okay. Um, so. Anyway, I, I will point out that paragraph because that is something that you have never seen in your financial statements before. Um, it's new and uh, we want to make sure that that is correct. Uh, that is what's been conveyed to us. And so we would, before, before this is finalized, we want to make sure that that's still the uh, current intent. On this same page, page 44, note five, this is the changes in capital assets as a municipality. Uh, the infrastructure is a big part of what you have. And you see that uh, this carries the beginning balance uh, forward to the ending balance of, at the end of the year. The total governmental, I'm in the middle of the uh, page, uh, or the middle of the table there. there. It started, the total governmental the capital assets at the beginning of the year were 12.4 million, and they ended at just over 12.4 million. So not a, not a big uh, increase there. You can see that the, the assets continue to be depreciated. So the, the governmental net assets, uh, they started the year at 10.8 million and they, after depreciation was done, they ended just under 10.5 million at 10 million, 458,000. So that's the governmental activity. Then the next two table, or the next part of that table are the proprietary funds. You see that they started at a, a net amount of 1.7 million and after depreciation, they were 1,671,000. No additions. As a municipality, uh, lots of times people are concerned about the debt that the, uh, the, the town is carrying or the city is carrying. On page 47, this is note 9, you'll see the schedule of the different loans that uh, the city has outstanding. And when I say loans, I'm a debt, a loan, or a bond. And uh, in the far right column, you see that the total governmental activities had outstanding debt at the end of the year of 1738000 The proprietary funds had outstanding debt of 23000 for a total of 1761000 of debt at the end of the year. 
Now we're going to jump forward several pages, about a quarter of an inch or more, to page 85. Let's get back to the opinions. Page 85 is the Independent Auditor's Report on Internal Control over Financial Reporting and on Compliance and Other Matters Based on an Audit of Financial Statements Performed in Accordance with Government Auditing Standards. The sentence that you're looking for on this first page is the very last sentence, uh, the last two sentences, where we say, we did not identify any deficiencies in internal control that we consider to be material weaknesses. However, material weaknesses may exist that have not been identified. But again, that's what you're looking for on that page. If you turn the page, there's a paragraph titled Compliance and Other Matters. And the, the, the sentence there that you're looking for is the last one. The results of our test disclosed no instances of non-compliance or other matters that are required to be reported under government auditing standards. Those are the, those are the phrases that you like to see there. Turning the page to page 87, this is the management letter. It's a couple of pages long. The uh, important sentences that I would point out here, again, the very last one on the first page, there were no findings or recommendations made on internal control and compliance issues during the preceding annual financial audit. Then turning the page to the section called Financial Conditions and Management, the last paragraph in that section, section 10.5441I2, Rules of the Auditor General requires that we communicate any recommendations to improve financial management in connection with our audit. We did not have any such communications. The next section, additional matters, last sentence in that paragraph, in connection with our audit, we did not note any such findings. And then the very last page is the Independent Accountant's Report on Compliance with Section 218.415, Florida Statute. The important sentence in this page is the third, third paragraph. In our opinion, the City of Bel Air Beach, Florida, complied in all material respects with the aforementioned requirements for the fiscal year ended September 30th, 2022. And that gets through the auditor's report. I have a question. I, I, did, I did tag that page that you referenced with regards to that large fine. Yes, ma'am. Are you looking to us for some feedback? Or, I mean, you know, you made it clear that that needs to be right. precise. Uh, it's my, my, so, so from a financial statement reporting perspective, we're concerned is, so the asset exists. There's, there's no doubt about that. The fines are being incurred. Um, is there going to be any negotiation of that and a write down? Uh, so if there is anticipated negotiation and that all of that isn't going to be collected, we would need to take that into consideration to see if that asset value should be lowered. Uh, we call that a allowance against it. Because it's grown down to 235,000. Yes. And it's, you know, I, we've never yet collected a fine at large, so I think there's probably some opportunity for that. And, and so you know, that's and we, although none of us want to, I think that that's the reality is. We, we, and so therefore we are asking um, from the city, uh, through city manager and council, what is the anticipated realizable value of that? And, and that's, we need you all to give us a number and then we have to audit that. Do you need the number tonight? No, sir. No. But, but, but it is something that, that would need to be finalized before we make the decision of is it is the report going to uh, be submitted by the 331 deadline for GFOA? Will it be extended? Uh, it, it is something that will have to be resolved before the audit is finalized, but no, sir, it does not have to be done tonight. Any other questions from the council? No. Okay, so um, uh, City Manager Reefer, this was placed on the agenda as to accept this report, it doesn't say anything about draft. Um, so, are we should we table this, or, uh, or or are you asking us to just accept the draft one for now? Uh, and uh, with the expectance that we're going to receive a final copy later. Yes, uh, I sh should have included a draft in, in the agenda item. The um, we wanted to get the salt marsh to come in and. 
present with the audit is where it is now. It still needs to go to the audit committee, um, which we need to form um, with one member from council. So I'm going to need a motion uh, from a council member to uh, modify this agenda item uh, to, uh, to say draft uh, annual comprehensive financial report. So uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so we're going to change that to uh, direct. And then uh, uh, what I'm going to need now is a motion to accept this draft report. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Can I further propose another motion? Uh, you sure can. committed to him to meet 
and discuss this matter with the manager this week and provide him, um, at least from the city's perspective, where matters stand. Uh, we need to determine what the applicable restrictions are with the code, if any, as it relates to permitting, um, and also um, what, what questions we have substantively about this particular operation, uh, this particular antenna, uh, and the specifics of the property. So there's not a hearing date set at the moment to answer your question. There's nothing in the near future. No, sir, that's not true. I think that I've already told, I've, as I've stated, I intend to speak with their attorney today. If you're asking me if there's a code enforcement hearing scheduled, there is not. If you're asking me if there's a board of adjustment hearing scheduled, there is not. What we need to determine is what best, what procedure is most appropriate, and the procedure will be determined by the work product that comes out of our uh, out of our exchanges. Okay. Um, not everything is predetermined. And that'll be by week end. My aim is by week's end to have a path forward. I'm, he, I've committed to get information as has his counsel. Um, the process is not as fixed and uh, concrete as uh, your questions seem to desire it to be. Other questions or comments from the council? Mm -hmm. Mr. Moore, uh, thank you uh, very much for, uh, for your patience and, uh, and we uh, anticipate hearing something good soon. This is Tom. Right. Now we are moving on to item nine, which is the city manager's report. Mr. Riefler, take it away. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, uh, we are wrapping up the 12th and 13th and day uh, stormwater project. Uh, the last thing we did was uh, called out the contractor and subcontractor to redo a curved segment on 13th Street, which was not uh, producing the proper quality of the water into the drain. Um, that is complete. <coughs> the uh, contractor has requested the, uh, the rest of the payment for the retainage, and we uh, are closing that project this week. Um, once I get a confirmation of all the means are released for the city. The uh, Gulf Boulevard Underground Project, uh, we, we had another progress meeting on March 1st. Uh, Duke, we keep pushing Duke to tell us um, Try to get an update on when the material is going to be delivered, and uh, the Duke representative did state that they do not have a date, but they will keep checking. So we, our permitting is right on um, to be ready as soon as the uh, material shows. The Gulf of Mexico buoy replacement. Um, I actually did find uh, a cheaper solution uh, from American Underwater Contractors, uh, going back to the helical anchors. Um, they've done it in the past for us in uh, talking to the contractor. They felt confident that they would be able to locate the majority of the existing anchors from their experience. And, um, you know, there would be a minimum charge of when we needed to install another anchor. I think that's the best way to move forward. And uh, I remember in 2018 when we were getting quotes, uh, the, the diver team was the more expensive route and doing the concrete blocks, but now it seems to have changed, so that's positive. The uh, stormwater improvement projects, uh, we had a, a meeting um, with the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee on February 22nd, um, where a um, presentation of the bond issue and uh, some term sheets, pluses and uh, positives and negatives of where we stand as a city and our ability to take on debt. The CAC, and we had an um, actual uh, citizen president um, attend the meeting as well. They were all in support and making a recommendation um, for the chair uh, and myself to present in March 20th, I presume, um, the third Monday of the month uh, work session. So that, uh, that is planned to be an agenda. The uh, code enforcement analysis, uh, analysis project uh, continue to move forward. I uh, continue with the change in the reporting. I am getting our community services uh, administrator more directly involved with uh, some doing some of the day to day. Um, I feel like the, making him familiar with the code enforcement process and the codes in general, um, given the amount of time that he is in the city, a full full time job. Uh, that you will assist in uh, producing more efficient code enforcement. So looking forward to keep going with that. Uh, I haven't heard any change on the April 14th uh, shipping date from the 
the playground set. Um, so we took a little closer for confirmation. The uh, the motor park parking lot it, it was completed on February 16th. Um, I plan on dropping that off of, of this list as well as the we finally come close out all the POs for the uh, seawall and the ramp <coughs> replacement um, project. The I'm scheduling meetings with departments this week to uh, um, go over proposed budget changes. Um, we continue to work on the budget. I will turn that into the financial um, administrator or our financial consultant at the end of the month um, to move forward. We have had our schedule that we would, our financial consultant for the April meeting to present a, uh, an overall report on where we stand uh, at the close of the last budget year and what the what changes and things we should um, recommendations we should, and things we should look forward to um, when we start the, this next year's budget process um, and then last uh, the it, you're probably aware that we've been getting some more uh, red tide in the area uh, the, the health department of the state of Florida uh, provided us with a uh, flyer notice on Friday Friday and um, we posted that uh, to the recommendation. Um, at that point, there weren't very many fish on the, on the beach. On Saturday, it was reported that, that the fish kill had increased and there were fish on the beach. Um, we went out there um, starting this morning to, in our best efforts with our staff <coughs> to start cleaning the fish, picking them, and I think they did a lot of Beside what others, um, we actually had residents that uh, collected fish in their own bags, they picked up those bags and then I think all 11 on their own, um, full trash bags. Luckily, uh, when I went out and checked on it uh, in Morgan Park at about 1.30 this afternoon, the tide was washing up and it significantly did decrease um, the amount of fish that were still laying on the beach and I did not see a, a, a large amount floating in the water. Um, but that all could change by tomorrow, uh, just depending on that. We could have end up with more fish or, or continue to stay uh, fortunate. Uh, the staff did work from Morgan Park down south. Um, so if the fish to numbers do not increase, uh, we expect to have a, a fairly significant, um, you know, 95% cleanup by tomorrow. But we'll continue, we're committed to continue to keep working on picking up the fish at, at the fastest uh, that we can in-house. Um, I have been in contact with the county. Um, they have not started the, the outside contractors to be picking up the fish at this point, and they have not started their roll-off dumpster program that they did in the past, um, where they provided the actual dumpsters for collection. Um, just as a, a precautionary, uh, action we did order uh, a roll of dumpsters line specifically for fish from waste management just to have ready that's all council i'll um came to the council's attention that there's a disabled child around 21st street i know god boulevard is county of street or road, road excuse me can we put up a sign there through the city notifying the traffic that there is a disabled child in heat wave pool. They, they do make those signs and I have seen them so it can be installed. By our city or by the we have by the city. Yeah, it's our our discussion. So that can be brought up in our work session. Um there's no major objection. Maybe we take it to the work session just to, for a quick discussion to see if there's any uh, other opinions but um, if not, I feel like it's something that would benefit that child on the street. We could do it. Would a uh, motion be suitable for this council to put up a sign there? You're welcome to make any motion you want. I'd like to make a motion to put up a sign, maybe two signs notifying there's a disabled child, handicapped child between 19th and maybe 23rd Street. Second. Second by Mark Zabel. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, Mr. Mayor. I just want to clarify. Are you, are you proposing on the golf board or on the actual street that the child lives on? No. 
between 19th and 23rd. Um, got bored because. Oh, because I, I don't think we can place it on Boulevard, right? We can place it in the neighborhood. That's what we said. I mean, Golf Boulevard is not our way. Yeah, that was my question. If okay. we were allowed to do it on Golf Boulevard. No, we can put it on our private streets, but we cannot. Unless I get permission from the county. I can reach out and find out their stance. But at minimum, we can put it in the neighborhood. Yes. So let's at least do that. And this, you can do that on your own and then work with the county angle as well. But at least have that. Yeah, at least put it on 21st and then Any other questions or comments? Uh, yes. But yeah, on that uh, topic as well, can we look at maybe installing a mobi mat? Um, and then if you can coordinate uh, with our citizen out here about specifically what's wrong with you know, the handrails, we'll try to see what we can do to you know, make the accommodations. And again, the mobi mat basically just hits the, it's where it, it enters the sand, the bridge, but it goes out. So you can actually take wheelchairs out on this mat with them, see them over at Clearwater. So if you, Check those out and then uh, report back to the council that you coordinated with. See what we can support you with. Uh, council Member Sable, I, I will uh, uh, respond to that. that we actually had the opportunity to have those installed for free. And whenever they came and they surveyed our accesses, they weren't suitable for, for a movie map. I mean, maybe it was something completely different, but just want to keep. Keep that in mind. We'll, we'll look into it and we'll see what we can come up with. But uh, it may not, it may not be a, a conventional solution. So. All right. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Kyle, this the city hall generator. I may have missed that. Did you, did you bring that up? I, I I left it on there. I've not, there's been no change since I received the last quote for the used diesel generator. Okay. I did not hear anything. Uh, kind of moving forward with that. I mean, I think that's a great idea. What was the original budget line item for a new one? The original budget was uh, over two years and we were saving $250,000. Um, and then when, I, when we first started looking into this, that I um, presented to you with the estimate, went up to about like, I think it was 260 or 270. Okay. And I started chipping away, the, away for a cheaper. So this would be a big save. <coughs> that's great. Do we happen to know the specs on this particular one in regards to um, how long it will run on a full tank at, at full power? I, I do have the specs, so I can present that. Okay. okay. That's good. And also, I know we had discussed previously the lining of the uh, two pipes on the 12th and 13th Street project. What's the, what's the status on that? Uh, the status on that is that I'd like to build it into uh, the next stormwater bid that we do um, to get the most competitive pricing. So that would be the one we're going to go after the five projects. Yes, the perfect. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Not that we will do right on to City Clerk's report. No report this month. No report. I have a brief question. Uh, Patty, I don't have the handouts for tonight. Pardon? I don't have the handouts that were on the table. All the city council members received handouts. I did not receive handouts. Okay, thank you. I stole mine. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No, appreciate that. Thanks. Any Thank questions you. for Ms. Gentry? No. All right. Thank, thank you. Much. Okay, uh, now we're up to item number 11. This is a public hearing. Uh, this is a consideration of Ordinance 23-01. Mr. Morrow, would you please read the ordinance? Happy, happy Mr. Mayor, if you excuse me, one moment to get the materials. This is a second reading of the ordinance as, um, as stated earlier within the hearing. In the second hearing, we are, it is the final hearing for purposes of the this is Ordinance 23 01, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Bellar Beach, Florida, amending Section 94 220, pertaining to the table of designated living areas and housing setbacks, providing for severability and providing for an effective date. This is a second and final reading of Ordinance 23 01. 
Thank you, Mr. Laura. Uh, let's go to uh, citizen comments. Good evening, Council Mayor. My name is Mark Pope and a resident of 523 Bell Isle Avenue. Um, thank you, Mr. Zabel, for the detailed notes from the last council meeting. We were unable to attend uh, the reading by title only of this ordinance. Uh, my comments are going to cut across a couple of points real quickly. First of all, after detailed analysis of the table, I could not understand uh, the kind of arbitrary nature of the setback by lot difference. And secondly, I did not see any uh, commentary that we had done any benchmarking of similar setbacks uh, of other beach towns, as well as um, in uh, alignment with the setbacks uh, recommended at the county level. As a personal note, our lot, I measured today based on the table, and my house already is over the limit. Um, my house was built in 1974, there's been no material changes, um, and I would just like to present to council that maybe we take a pause on this ordinance, have a more detailed study, understand how these setbacks are actually uh, calculated, and again, benchmarking and or um, uh, subordinate uh, deference to the county standard. Thank you, Mr. Pope. Uh, we're going to be discussing this uh, right after citizens' comments, and uh, maybe you'll understand where we're going with this. Uh, anyone else like to uh, make a comment on this topic? Jennifer Pope, Jennifer Pope, 523 Bell Isle. I just wanted to add on to um, his comments around the setbacks. I mean, the purpose of setbacks are essentially to preserve our views between our neighbors and as we look at this I'm just looking at it from a fairness perspective because there are some that are seven and a half foot some are ten foot we actually are the ten foot and so arguably we should be happier than the seven and a half foot because we have 20 feet between our neighbors but our lots aren't that big and so if there was an opportunity where we said we wanted to add portico something that prevents us from adding anything to our lot if we want to do any kind of improvements when we don't need 20 feet in between ours and our neighborhood, our, our, our lot and our neighbor's lot to preserve our view, which is really the purpose of having setbacks between your neighbors. Thank you, Ms. Pope. Any other comments from the uh, citizens? Nope. Okay, uh, before we go any further, I'm going to need a motion to approve ordinance 23-01. Do I have a motion? So moved. Motion made by Vice Mayor Shirley. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Lloyd Roberts. Uh, Vice Mayor, you have the floor. Well, I'm, um, the way I'm looking at this, I think we're just cleaning up some language and not necessarily changing anything. And I may be completely off base, but I'm curious to know why that's, this is going to happen. Thank you very much uh, for the question. And the manager asked a question that I address it. Um, the setback amounts in, in each of the areas identified in the table remain the same. We are not actually altering any of the setback proposals by this ordinance. What we are trying to resolve is confusion caused by the previous layout of the table and the Scrivener's errors concerning the spelling of Bellevue um, states where it was spelled with a V-U-E versus a V-I-E-W. Um, the format of the ordinance sets forth that in the form of the strikers and underlines. Given how much content was in that table, it's actually called out in red text additionally, which we don't um, typically do. But what we've done here is fix the spelling and, and fix the formatting to make it more clear so that the way it was reading previously, um, Bellevue Estates had different um, setbacks for lots, certain lot numbers, which is still the case. And then further down within the table, it said Bellevue Estates Island and had something else. And then there was a, another row at the very bottom of the table um, that was not consistent. And that was leading to inconsistent results in engineering analysis and staff analysis of applications. Um, and in some cases, those inconsistent results resulted in uh, variances uh, or other um, administrative solutions to, to bring the pro property in compliance. As to individual properties that were constructed before these provisions, those non conforming structures, those dating back to the 60s and 70s, that's a completely different analysis. We are not proposing new setbacks be imposed or the demolition of any existing structures. 
This was really to clean up the table to avoid further confusion in future applications. And that's what you have before you on the second. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, any other uh, comments or questions on this topic? So, so to clarify, this is just language change? It's what is commonly described in many ordinances as housekeeping. Um, it is an attempt to, to clarify the, con the existing content of the code, not to impose new restrictions. It's not going to impact, as the citizens brought up, about their uh, lot, lot setbacks. It's not going to encroach on that. As it relates to somebody's structure that has been in place since the 70s, no, it does not have an impact. However, comma, if they are applying for some kind of new structure on their property, um, those setbacks as established would certainly apply. Um, so this does affect residents with intending to approach new development. And the intended impact most directly is that they have a, a clearer understanding and expectation of what they should develop. There was one instance in particular where a property, uh, a property owner sought development approval, um, staff looked at it and reached a conclusion as to one setback, the engineer looked at it, reached another, approved something, and that approved item was not consistent, was consistent with one part of the table but not the other. Um, and so to avoid that kind of confusion, this, this, uh, this was, again, as raised last time, somebody said, uh, I forget which one of you suggested this was a, a good catch within the code and where did it come from, and that came from your city manager um, in the course of administering um, applications and saying we can't have this kind of confusion and prioritizing. And uh, again, nice, nice catch on that, City Manager Reefer. Uh, if there are no other comments or questions, uh, I'm going to uh, ask Patty to uh, call the roll. Patty? Council Member Baker? Yes. Council Member Livingstone? Yes. Council Member Roberts? Aye. Council Member Zabel? Aye. Vice Mayor Shirley? Aye. Mayor Gattis? Aye. So it passes unanimously. Uh, ordinance 23-01. Thank you for your, uh, for your uh, work on this one, Mr. All right, now we are on to the consent agenda, items 12 and 13. Uh, this is for approval of the February 6, 2023 City Council meeting minutes a proclamation proclaiming the month of March 2023 as Problem Gambling Awareness Month. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve as written. Motion made by Frank Baker. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Lloyd Roberts. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the consent agenda passes. All right, now we are to the regular agenda. Item number 14. Consideration of Resolution 2023-01 Parking Rates at City Parks, uh, City Parking Lots. Uh, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this is Resolution 2023-01, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Bellar Beach, Florida, amending parking pay station hourly rates, based our park, the Community Center, City Hall, City Marine, and Morgan Drive Park, and establishing an effective date. This is the first and only reading of Resolution 2023-01 by title only. This resolution, as it's been put before you, is, is work product resulting from your work session held uh, late last month, just a couple weeks ago. And uh, this memorializes the terms of those, um, the lot hours, the parking fees of, of $5 per hour on weekdays in the respective lots, and then $10 per hour on weekends and holidays and the intended maximum limits and any free parking times. I will note uh, during your work session, there was, as I understand it, some discussion concerning um, corresponding parking fines. You already have language in your code in section 58-37 and 58-38 concerning fines, um, civil penalties. Uh, a resolution cannot supersede an ordinance, uh, so we cannot do it that way if we are to change those. We would do so uh, via ordinance, so that's why what you have here is just the parking rates, not any um, penal element to it um, as to what happens if you're if you're uh, not in compliance. Um, and and I, I've spoken with the manager. Were we to do that, what would be done by ordinance? One of the things that we're considering in, in, in a form of staffing, should that come before you, is uh, at least an informal rate study, inquiries of other communities as to where they are, so we can make sure we're in line with that. Um, and with any due consideration of applicable uh, statutes or other restrictions on those things. 
Thank you, Mr. Mora. Before we uh, begin a discussion on this, uh, let's go to the citizens for comments. Would anyone like to speak on this? Yes, sir, please come up. Good evening, uh, Barry Gray, 108 12th Street. Um, as far as parking in this lot, is this the consideration that we're under? Is this lot included in that? Yes. Um, I have a problem with, on the weekends, people park here. They go over to the 12th Street Beach Access. They put up their umbrellas, and by the time we get out there, if we're not running out there at 9 o'clock, there's no place for us to go. It's been taken over by people who are trespassing. So um, I'm looking for remedy. I think this parking lot should be closed off to any type of uh, outside parking. You, you're you're, you're uh, precluding us from having enjoyment of our beach and baking purposes. So uh, that will be my comment about this lot. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Any other comments from the citizens? Yes. Debbie Ma, 115 Causeway. I, I agree uh, with Barry Gray with his comments. I, I think we have to have parking here, though, I believe, for beach nourishment. Is that correct? So perhaps we can, at least on the weekends, make it more expensive um, so that we deter people from two different things. They come here, they'll park, they'll take their umbrellas and things, and they put them up there, and then they will go park across the bridge. One person will then come back, or they just leave them there the whole day. And as Barry said, if we're not down there by 10 o'clock, you, you aren't getting an umbrella up on the weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the citizens? No? All right. Uh, now we are to council. Uh, before we get started on this conversation, I'm going to need a motion to approve this resolution. So moved. Second. Can you make the first one? Mike did. Mike did. Okay. And then Frank. And then Frank. All right. Mr. Zay, what do you have for? Uh, just, yeah, absolutely addressing your uh, comments. Uh, it used to be $4 and $5. Uh, we moved it for, excuse me, uh, $5 during the weekday to $10. So it basically more than doubling it. Um, to uh, basically try to find the pain threshold. If you have a parking decal, you're good. These are for the outside people. And also, we want to clear something up right here for everybody. We're not stopping on street parking. We'll always have that. You just call, you know, City Hall, arrange it. Uh, but uh, again, we more than doubled it to $10 an hour. So that's, I, I don't know, we talked about that. It's more than uh, area uh, parking charges. Roberts. I just want to clarify, so Mrs. Small, when you were saying that, were you envisioning that, let's say we made it $100 an hour so people wouldn't park there, you're saying they would typically drive here, drop off their crew, then go back across the bridge. So, okay, so you're saying that even if we, even if we made it uncomfortable, they're typically going to find another way to do that by dropping off the crew, put the umbrellas out, going back across the bridge, getting somebody a bicycle or getting a taxi or one of those other companies to bring it back over and they're still going to steal the spots from the deep. So, okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, uh, there's really nothing we can do about it because yeah. we uh, we gave up our rights as a private beach to accept beach Thank you. I might disagree with that statement. I, I don't think that we should be incentivizing people to park in our lots and use our accesses. And by keeping our park, our parking fees are considerably less than the beach at Clearwater Beach. By doing that, we are incentivizing people to park here instead of there. So if we make it whatever the pain threshold is, it will at least deter them. I realize we probably can't stop everybody, but I think we can reduce the problem to some extent. 
Thank you, Ms. Long. Can I just add, I think that's what we're trying to do is kind of deter people from coming to the beach because we have the same issue at Morgan Park where you just can't get in a parking spot. You know, that's where we have facilities if you uh, want to go to the park with your grandchildren when you have a restroom facility that you use, you can't get a parking spot there and we don't have any reserved residential spaces. It's the same problem up and down the beach. So we're trying to raise these rates high enough to deter people from being at the beach too long too. We're putting some time limits on it. But I noticed on this proposal, as, as we talk about that, do we need to have the limits on uh, Bayside Park and City Hall? I was going to make that suggestion because we originally did. Uh, we didn't, we weren't really aware that it was a problem. Uh, uh, more than, you know, 10 bucks an hour all day long. I, I really, I didn't envision anyone being here all day long, but for 100 bucks, it may, may be worth it to someone to be here for 10 hours. What does the council, what does the council think on uh, putting limits on it, just like we have with uh, the Marina and the Park? I, 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 would do that. I think it, I think it should have a limit on it because then it's going to deter people from bringing their tents and coolers and staying out there, which seems to be an issue. I would say. Uh, Yes, sir. Mr. Gray. They're going to get there. Um, I think the solution is, like Bella Shore has it in their uh, ordinance, that they can, have, they can ask these people who are setting up behind their houses, whether they're in the um, below the wet sand or whatever, um, if they're residents, and if they're not, they make them leave. Now, if these people from who knows where they come from set up in our lot, are we uh, able to call the police and have them prove that they're residents here? I don't believe that's the case because we have public access. Okay. It's not that, that the public access on the, in our areas is not, is, uh, you're talking about 12. Well, that any, any of the 6th Street, 12th Street, I, I think once they get onto the beach, there's not really anything we can do about it. What if they're sitting up in the, in the area that has now been designated our area to, to set up and have an umbrella? What if they're now sitting in what has been designated? I'm, I'm going to interrupt you right now. I, I don't think that we're prepared to answer those questions. Uh, I think it's going to require some more research, and maybe we will uh, we'll have this discussion in a work session and see if we can get more information uh, from our city attorney. And uh, it, it's just not a, a topic we're prepared to discuss at this moment. Uh, uh, right now, we're, we're trying to focus on uh, parking rates and uh, securing a new uh, metering system uh, for parking. Uh, so. Um, I very much appreciate your comments, and I would like to, to move on. Um, so we're back to the uh, to the limit, the time limit on the um, on, on the uh, park. I'm going to need a motion if someone wants to uh, reduce those. Motion. Motion made by Frank Baker. Do I have a second? I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. What is the nature of the motion is to amend the resolution. I'm sorry, I should have made that clarification. Three hours. As to be safe, Park and Mississippi City Hall, correct? I think that that would be, uh, yeah, across the board. And, and, I, and I don't mean to be rude. I understood that's where you're going. I just want to clear the record that that's the motion. Okay, and did we have a second? Second. Second, made by Jody Shirley. Uh, Mr. Banker, do you have the floor? Um, I think this helps. I don't think it cures it. I mean, I, I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, about a work session to address other problems. The electric bikes are a big thing now at 12th and 6th Street. We make our residents pay for a sitting tag. These electric bikes, as the one resident says, take up uh, 
parking benches and everything like that. It's a, it's a matter to be discussed tomorrow or the next day. But um, I think a three hour limit will help. I agree. Um, and, and also, this will uh, definitely be a good trial balloon for uh, their pain threshold, as, uh, uh, as uh, the, one of the citizens said, and also as uh, Mike Zabel brought up. Um, if it continues to be a problem and we're just completely overwhelmed with people that uh, have no problem paying $30 and then moving on, um, uh, we may raise it even higher. So we'll just see where that goes. Um, any other comments on uh, changing the limits, uh, the hour limits on parking at Bayside and City Hall? So I know we discussed this at the workshop. So if I'm a mile apart and my three hours are up, does anything preclude me from coming back and paying for an additional three hours? Well, you wouldn't come back because there's no physical machine. You would just open your app. But we're, we, uh, with this resolution, we will be blocking the ability of them to renew their three hours. So three hours and then you the old chalk thing on the time to move it up before it's your lot. Exactly. Exactly. With the current system, it would not have been able to do that. That's right. They would just come back and put more money in. Correct. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they're going. But can they move their car to a different parking spot? And nope. Then they can move their license plate in. Right. Just your driveway. Okay, so um, any other comments on this time limit uh, motion before we uh, continue forward? Okay, so my, my motion is still on there to vote to approve. Okay, as amended now. Yep, so uh, all in favor of amending resolution 202301. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, so uh, you're making those changes, and now we're back to, uh, we, we don't need a motion to, for the amended, uh, we're, we're, we're still on. There's already a motion on the floor to adopt the ordinance. You've now moved and approved to amend, so you revert back to the motion to, the to approve the ordinance, and with the understanding that it would be approved as amended. Okay, perfect. Okay, any other discussion on uh, approving this resolution as amended? No. Nope. We're going to need a, uh, need to call the roll, Maddie. Council Member Banker? Yes. Council Member Livingstone? Yes. Council Member Roberts? Aye. Council Member Zabel? Aye. Vice Mayor Shirley? Aye. Mayor Gattis? All right, so the resolution passes unanimously, and uh, we have a new parking rates. Right. Now we are on to item number 15. Uh, this is to authorize city manager to execute a piggyback agreement with Park Mobile LLC. This was placed on the agenda by city manager Reaper. Uh, take it away, sir. This, uh, this agenda item is uh, a follow-up of our discussion we had in the work session a couple of weeks or a week and a half ago. Um, this, uh, I in contact with Park Mobile, they were able to uh, provide the piggyback agreement from uh, St. Petersburg. Um, I worked diligently with uh, Attorney Morris, colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Eschenfeld, and uh, we, uh, we we revised the contract to, 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 to the attorney's liking. Uh, they were agreeable with all the amendments that we did, so we are we're comfortable with, with reviewing the contract to make sure it legally suffices for the city's needs. Um, as a little background, uh, we, we've had a, I couldn't find the exact date of how long we've, we've actually owned a parking unit. I know it's over 13 years, um, but we are a financial system we're, we're operating on a QuickBooks and only went back that far um, without searching um, through some of our records. Um, so we've had the, we, we own all the meters. Uh, we have four meters. We own, we own them. Uh, in, we've purchased them in order of Bayside Park, the Marina, Morgan, and City Hall was the most recent. I know that went in in 2018 because uh, I helped install it. Um, so 
the, uh, the manual parking meters, uh, you know, throughout my experience with them, they, uh, they require frequent maintenance um, and staff time. Uh, they just do not hold up well. Probably do better in some environments that aren't so close to the salt water air, but we, uh, we constantly are, are spending time replacing parts and troubleshooting them. So uh, this was presented in the work session, um, just as a recap, and uh, we did an analysis of the revenue and expenditures, um, showing it, at least that we break even, if not profit more. Um, we're quite certain that the profits will, the margin will increase um, now that we've uh, uh, approved increasing the parking rates. Um, and then yeah, I, I just wanted to include, uh, if this is approved, I will pursue selling the existing assets of which the parking meters back to the vendor um, to recoup some, some uh, cost items. Thank you. Uh, before we bring it back to the council, let's go to the citizens for comments. I'd like to make a comment on uh, bringing in Park Mobile and replacing our, our existing parking meters. All right, back to the council. Uh, we're going to need a motion to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement with Park Mobile. Do I move? Second. I didn't oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, I'm not the only one. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's all right. And the second was made by Frank Baker. Mr. Zabel, you have a Okay, going back to uh, Park Mobile, we had all um, voted unanimously to select Kyle as our city manager. What many didn't know is that he was spending quite a bit of time doing the maintenance on these machines, including running out, finding parts, trying to get it repaired. And we all said we want to give him all the tools available to make him successful. And one of those was removing excess work. Um, that's what we're doing with this Park Mobile plan. Uh, he just alluded to, yeah, we did the spreadsheet. Um, we're looking forward to at least a small profit, but that was based on $4 an hour. Um, coupled with that savings as stood with $4, and then we're talking the increases to 5 during the weekday and 10 uh, during the weekends. Um, look forward to a pretty uh, solid uh, profit off this move. So uh, again, thank you, Kyle, for hitting us up, running down all the numbers and uh, your diligence on this matter. Any other comments from the council on this? Yes. Yeah, I just want to clarify. I think this decision with Park Mobile is a great decision, but I don't want to um, confuse people by the fact that Mr. Zabel just talked about increasing the prices. Clearly, we could have done the same thing with the existing systems, so the profit would have been there as well. But the Park Mobile, Mobile decision is a good decision. I just don't want people to think that, well, wow, because we got the Park Mobile, we can increase the prices, and we couldn't do that before. Clearly, we could. Yeah, the, uh, the key of the Park Mobile, though, is, yeah, you can increase both, but under this system, you could stop, like we just said, the max hours. You can't do that with the other system. Yeah, I was just clarifying the cost. Yeah, no, I understand. But thank you. Well, we actually did have maximum hours, but you, 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 it's maximum you could feed the meter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Councilmember Banker? Yes. Councilmember Livingstone? Yes. Councilmember Roberts? Aye. Councilmember Zabel? Aye. Vice Mayor Shirley? Aye. Mayor Gattis? Aye. So again, passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Reaper, you are authorized to proceed to engage with Park Mobile LLC. Mayor, uh, before we proceed to the agenda, if I may ask your indulgence on a procedural matter. Um, Respectfully requesting that we reopen the hearing on resolution 2023-01 on the parking fees. And, um, I, as I review it, I notice that while it states in the title that it, it provides an effective date, um, I believe somewhere in the draft and, and transmission that that language fell off. And I would just like to indulge the commission, or council rather, to uh, amend the resolution further to state the resolution shall take effect immediately upon adoption so that there's no uh, misunderstanding as to that fact. 
so much. Yeah. I'd like to make a motion to uh, place the effective date on the amended resolution. Second. Motion made by Mike Sable, seconded by Frank Banker. All in favor? I'm here before we go now. Since we have to take public comment as it's an official act and just specify, cl clarify, Member Zabel, you're, you're suggesting that resolution 2023-01 has adopted the further amended to add language stating, stating that it would take effect immediately upon adoption, is that correct? That is correct. There's a motion and a second on the floor, Mr. Mayor. We'll just take any public comment before we pass on that. Citizens. Seeing no comments from the citizens. Back to the council, any comments from the council? Uh, I think we're gonna have to do this by roll call. Council Member Banker? Yes. Council Member Livingstone? Yes. Council Member Roberts? Aye. Council Member Dable? Aye. Vice Mayor Shirley? Aye. Mayor Gavis? Aye. And so the amended, amended resolution passes unanimously. Thank you, Council.
wait a couple of years to go back, we do it again, hire another out, outside consultant, doesn't cost us any money at all. And their objective is to see how well is that current system working based on the original study. So they're going to do that. We talked about many things. There's many, many options available out there. I can assure you the following, and typically county transportation departments will do this, I'll make sure they do this, that before any decisions are made, they will come up here and have like an open house, sometimes multiple open houses, because they'll have the first one to say, after the study, after receiving input from the citizens, and trust me, when I talk about some of the options, it was because citizens called and talked to me about what's going on up here. So, those type of an open house will take place where the citizens have an opportunity, we'll probably have it right in here, they'll have big whiteboards up and things like that to show you graphically what some of the options are, where you will have input to say, hey, I like that, or I think that's terrible, and here's why. And then they'll talk through it, and they'll typically come back with another one with updated data and information, unless the first one, everybody said that's perfect, which is unlikely. Um, so, that, so that's where we are. That's where we are today. I feel, I feel bad that some of our citizens, like you guys, got uh, rolled up into this because of some emails that went out by a council member that kind of gave opinions and summaries. It would have been better for that not to happen. Now, the council member says, hey, um, we're talking about these things, and if you want to refer to uh, some of the videos out there, the tapes, I recommend you look at minute 11 or something like that. It may be interesting to you. That's fine. But when we're saying things out there that may or may not be completely accurate or completely um, finished with regards to what's going on, that causes problems and it causes citizens to get excited about things that they don't have to. Because nothing's going to happen, I assure you, until we've studied this thing and have come out with better ideas. I know, for example, there's some comments made about everybody loves the uh, blinking yellow light, as do I, most citizens in the city. You can't have that with two left-hand turn lanes. You cannot have it. It's against traffic rules. The only way we can get back the blinking yellow turn light is to have a single turn lane. So that's just one fact that, that's out there. So there's multiple ways to take a look at this, and, and we will do that, and that, that's what I'm doing now. Um, I study it every day, every day when I drive through there. I, if I'm coming from St. Pete and heading north, it's interesting to me, the last couple of times I've had the, I was the first car to stop at the traffic light. So I get to watch, and this would typically be about 5 o'clock, 5.30, watch the vehicles coming to the south, both of them turning to the left, Nobody follows the white uh, dash line. Everybody's cutting this way. My biggest concern is it's not even the potential traffic crash problem with the vehicles. I'm thinking more of if somebody's on the right-hand side as they're making that left-hand turn, somebody on the inside bumps them, and God forbid there's somebody walking on that sidewalk with a child or by themselves, and that vehicle jumps the curb. That's what I'm most concerned about. So I, I know there's a better solution out there. There has to be. And that's what I'm working towards. But again, you have my assurance. We're not, we're not going to make this blindly. I don't know how the current scenario was approved previously. You know, I asked the county, and I said, well, how did you guys do this before? I think he told me when he met with the city manager and the mayor, they discussed it, and the decision was made. So we're going to do better than that this time. We're going to make sure the citizens are involved, they see pictures, they know what's going to happen, and they have an opportunity to tell us whether or not that meets your desires. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Now we move on to Council Member Livingstone. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Roberts, for that explanation. I think you did a very good summary. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming this evening and thank you for your comments. We do take those very seriously. Um, I want to thank Councilmember Bagger for moving forward with the um, request for the disabled child. Um, thank you very much for that. So, 
Thank you. Uh, now we are up to Council Member Baker. For the record, I was not attacking the mayor. Factually, I noted the impact of residents in support. And I don't believe that would be an attack. But before I noted the tower infraction, and it is a tower, it's not an intent. We discussed in length toilet water, pipe gurgling, and homes. Both can be messy. But this is a nine month problem that could kill someone. And that's why I was passionate in my plea. There was no attack to you. You've done nothing but been a gentleman to me since, I, since you've taken office. Hopefully, I'm going to try to say to you. Um, I want to really, she left, but I, I really want to thank the parks director. Uh, last month, we had a pet supply drop off for Pinellas County. Um, we loaded up my back of my pickup truck. And uh, they were so grateful for all this stuff. Things that these fine residents, hopefully, we'll have another one. But it, it, it was very, very touching with all the stuff we've done. Now, I don't want to be the cockroach on the Christmas turkey here, but anything that we do to offset this traffic problem for tourists, it's only going to make it worse. Okay, if you have tourists coming from Clearwater and they see an easy way now out of uh, Bel Air Beach, we're going to get more tourists using that area. This is, a, this is about a 60 day problem we face every year. Come May, we won't even be talking about this until next March or next February. Leave it alone. I think, I think just leave it alone. That island is beautiful. Uh, that crosswalk is very necessary. I tried crossing at that causeway a number of times. I have a councilwoman there. Right next to me, she knows it's a hazard. Uh, that causeway crosswalk. I think we just should leave it alone. That's all I have to say. Thank you. All right, now we are up to Max Mayor Shirley. Um, so I attended the um, mayor's luncheon um, this past week, and the League of Cit the Florida League of Cities did a uh, legislative update as they enter into um, that season, and it was they went through a number of bills that are um, being discussed right now, and, and several things to kind of watch for. And one, once again, is the SB 714 is short-term rental, which is um, actually being supported by uh, Desiglia. Um, so just kind of some things that, uh, you know, naming these bills just some for residents and other council members to take a look at. There was one they talked about which really affects um, every community in, in the state, and it's HB 617, or excuse me, 671 and SB 682, and it's, the, the league is recommending opposing, but it's uh, regarding building permits, and they're requiring that building permits uh, be approved in a very short amount of time, really, and, and if the city can't get it done, then there's there are consequences. So just some things to look at there. Um, also some things to land development code. And then I guess just for council members, this is important, that the, the, the league is now offering Monday mornings, 9 a.m., a call in, um, just call in a live update of what's happening. Really probably a good thing for all of us to take a look at. And then this is something I would like for maybe planning we could have available to residents. And it's, um, you can scan it, but it's, the. League of Cities has put together, Florida League of Cities has put together um, citizens' voice information. So you can go on here, take a look at, if that will look at QR code to scan, um, give you updates and information on what we can do to keep uh, governmental decisions at a local level, to give the, the cities more autonomy to make their own decisions rather than state level. And uh, there is a big push to take city rights away from cities and put out at a, at a state level. So um, maybe Patty can get these. I'll leave these with you, Patty, and then, you know, anyone wants to scan now, we could do that. But that's, um, I think, oh, I guess I just one more, a um, couple other quick, quick comments is um, bike racks. I know there was a question about whether we can have bike racks. I know we talked about this before, getting more 
bed, park benches at the beach accesses. I don't know if the bike racks, I mean, I know it sounds like a great idea, maybe if we put them out towards the gates or something and not down where the uh, park benches are because this then just gives those same umbrella users at that beach access more access to them. If you give them a place to tie their bike up, they'll bring them on carts, they'll bring whatever they need to the beach for that day, and then now they have full access. So I don't know if we're creating a problem or not, but we might want to look at bike racks and have some discussion about that at the next work session. <coughs> I think that's it. Thank you for coming, Mel. Uh, let, me, let me comment on the bike racks. Uh, I, for some reason, I thought that we were moving the bike racks into the parking lot away from the beach entirely. But did that not happen? Remember that we were going to have more benches, and uh, according to the gentleman that was here tonight, nothing has been done. It's, I thought we had, we had benches. We were just going to relocate them. Uh, I remember us discussing that and never got approval from the other shores, so I'll reach out and get in comments to tell them the plan. But as far as adding the benches, there is no bike rack there. Okay, all right. I, I know we talked about possible locations for a bike rack. But no, if if uh, the residents aren't using them, uh, then probably no need to have them anyway. But I, I don't know if the residents are using them. I know that we, I see people ride bikes all the time, but I don't know if they take them to the beach. They tie them to the bench, that's the problem. So then the bench had, you right. can't sit on the bench because they've got them. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if that was us or if that was other communities. Right, gotcha. Okay, so I'll, I'll follow up with the other okay, so um, You've not contacted me yet about this, is that right? I, I have, I have a preliminary discussion only with the All right, uh, so uh, last month I, uh, I mentioned the beach nourishment and uh, the, the problems we've been having uh, where it looks like we're not going to get beach nourishment, at least not for the Army Corps of Engineers and the, uh, uh, the Fed. Uh, so uh, I have been working with, uh, with Mayor from North Reddington Beach, uh, Bill Queen also the mayor from uh, Indian Shores, uh, Pat Sorrento. And what we've been doing is we've been meeting with all the county commissioners to say, you're collecting a bed tax and it's reserved for us for beach nourishment. Well, you're saving all this money, so I need you to start coming up with a plan B. Because right now what they're doing is nothing. They've just been sitting on the money and and, and hoping that they don't have to spend it. Instead, they, uh, they, they get money from the federal government. Uh, the, the truth is, I don't think it's gonna happen, but uh, anyway, I met with uh, Dave Eggers today. Uh, he's on board uh, with, with trying to uh, do it ourselves rather than relying on the Army Corps. So whenever I say ourselves, I mean the, uh, the county. Uh, so he's on board. I uh, spoke with Kathleen Peters, uh, met with her about a week ago. She's on board. Janet Long, uh, she's slightly reluctant, but she is on board. Um, also the day that uh, Vice Mayor Shirley was at the Mayor's Council, she was sitting in for me because at that time I was meeting with Senator Ed Hooper uh, to find out if what the appropriate path would be to get more state funds to sweeten the pot for the county to want to do this. Uh, so uh, as it stands right now, we, uh, the Fed would do 60%, the county does 20, the state does 20. And what I asked uh, Senator Hooper for was to continue matching whatever it is we have to spend. Well, obviously we're not gonna get that, but you always ask for more and hopefully you get some of it instead of uh, none of it. Uh, so um, I know that uh, uh, Senator DeSeedley is not exactly uh, our favorite person because of the short-term rentals, but he is also another person that I'll be meeting with soon uh, to have the same conversation uh, about state funding 
And, uh, and then also, uh, city manager Reefler joined me, and we went to uh, the uh, tourist, Pinellas Tourist Development Council, uh, combined with the Pinellas uh, Board of uh, County Commissioners meeting. And uh, that gave me the opportunity to, to speak to every one of the commissioners one by one and introduce them to uh, our new city manager. Uh, so I, I think that we're making some progress on this uh, possibility of the county actually stepping up and doing what's right, which is to protect the cash cow that pays for baseball stadiums and sports complexes and things like that, uh, which is uh, uh, where a lot of that money goes to. Uh, so if you reinvest in the beaches, then um, the money will come back. Uh, and, and not only just for, right now, the, the, they keep hoping that the Fed is going to do something and, and actually say, nah, we'll give you another pass and we'll do your endorsement again. That's plan A, and I don't believe that's ever going to happen. Uh, plan B, uh, if we were discussing, and now I'm actually getting people to say plan B, which is really kind of cool, is that uh, they look at the emergency spots that need sand. We're one of them. Uh, Bel Air Beach is one. North Reddington Beach is the other. On Scott, and it's only Sand Key that's being ignored right now uh, by uh, the Army Corps because of those, uh, those people that will never, ever sign those easements. Uh, so uh, then there's a Plan C also, which we take a serious look at hardening our beaches so that we don't need uh, renourishment as often. It's always going to move. But eventually, uh, if, if the county will, will do the right thing and actually get this project started, instead of every five to seven years, we may not need nurse, but maybe every 10 years. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I have uh, a couple more meetings coming up uh, with, with various people. And uh, we'll see if we can uh, see if we can get them to to get this project started. Also, uh, speaking of the tourist development, uh, the uh, tourist development council, uh, it was uh, recommended because I attended that meeting that uh, the Big C actually has a delegate that's supposed to be going to that meeting and reporting back to the Big C, but they're not doing anything. And so I believe they're going to put me in place to go and sit in on these meetings so that I can actually make sure that Sam Key is actually being taken care of. Uh, because normally the, the, uh, the county commission, they're going to move on whatever recommendations are made by the Tourist Development uh, Council and um, we need a voice there. So um, that's enough about these, uh, Beach nourishment. I don't think that I have anything else uh, to discuss at this time other than I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight and for those that if there's anyone still watching on, uh, on their computers at home, thank you for attending. Uh, with that being said, do I have a motion? Oh, sure. Motion made by Frank Baker. And do I have a second? Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Good night, everyone.